Good morning, everyone. And uh, today uh, we are conducting our uh, echocardiogram, echocardiography uh, symposium, uh, Windows Through the Heart, uh, which is an echocardiography for non cardiac anesthetists. And uh, this will be led by uh, Amarya. And we have a galaxy of faculty. Uh, which will they'll be going through, um, you know, lectures on uh, cardiophysiology, uh, transthoracic echocardiogram view, uh, physics of uh, and principles of ultrasound, looking at systolic function, diastolic function, and we will also be talking about valvular heart disease uh, as well. So we have Amarya who's leading this uh, show. They have Dr. Achal Dhir. Uh, Dr. Katirwell Subramaniam, Dr. Praveen Kumar Neva, uh, Minati Chaudhary, uh, Guru Cynthia. So quite a few uh, faculty uh, uh, will be here with us. And uh, I'll be handing over to uh, Amarya for taking us through today's symposium. Uh, I will share the link on the Facebook group uh, so over to you, uh, Amarja. A very good evening to all of you. And uh, I welcome you all to the Window Through the Heart Echocardiography Symposium. I thank uh, Dr. Sheep, sir, uh, for uh, you know, all this uh, symposium um, and uh, for mainly the echocardiography symposium, uh, which he wanted to do. And uh, we, we all are very happy. And we have uh, eminent faculties all over the world uh, to, uh, who are joining us today. And the first lecture uh, will be on cardiac physiology by Achal Dhir sir. Achal Dhir sir is associate professor at London Health City uh, Health Sciences Center, University of Western Ontario, London, Ontario Province, Canada. He is also the director of liver transplant anesthesia. He has interests in liver transplant anesthesia and coagulation, cardiac anesthesia and transesophageal echocardiography, medical education, traveling and photography as well. Over to you, uh, Achal Dhir sir, for the first talk on cardiac physiology. Thank you very much, Amrja. And a big thanks, as usual, to Dr. Shiv, the, mm -hmm. the man behind uh, the symposium. Uh, are you able to hear me? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Rachel. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And I'm going to talk about basic cardiac anatomy and physiology. This is going to be a very, very basic talk. And uh, this is my hospital. I do not have any conflicts or any sponsorship for this particular lecture. And uh, my target audience would be non-cardiac anesthesiologist, especially the trainees. And I do apologize to my senior colleagues and other experts because this is going to be a very basic lecture just to begin this symposium. So when the oxygen became available on our planet Earth, the life started uh, erupting. So in life, it is all about survival. And for survival, it is all about oxygen. From the very beginning, the unicellular and, uh, creatures like uh, amoeba and bacteria, they get oxygen directly from the environment and they release their toxic products of metabolism, mainly the carbon dioxide, back into the environment. This goes on into multicellular animals and as big as flatworms, which are very flat and they get their oxygen directly from the atmosphere. But when you were talking about humans or big creatures like us, so we have trillions of cells and every cell needs oxygen. So something must be uh, reproduce, so it is outsourced. And we do that by having a cardiorespiratory system. First and foremost, there is layout of the railroad, that is the vessels. After that, we have the lungs, which are the suppliers of oxygen. 
And after that, we have the carriers of oxygen, that is the hemoglobin in our red blood cells. Finally, and the most importantly, we need the force to push this RBC into all different cells, and that is done by the heart. I call it mama or the mother of all organs. So when we look at the fetal cardiac development, we see that it is typical of the evolution. First, the heart is like a tube in our gestational period. It resembles the fish heart. After that, it becomes two chambers, which resembles an amphibian heart. Then it becomes three chambers, which uh, looks like a snake or a reptilian heart. And finally, the last phase is, which looks like a four chambered, our human heart. So this is a beautiful structure, which keeps on beating and it starts beating at uh, five to six weeks of gestation. And this is a typical symbol of love and affection. And I call it mother of all organs because it gives whatever it receives and it keeps on giving to all its children and family, feeding them with oxygenated blood. So this heart starts beating at five weeks or six weeks of gestation. It does not need anybody else like a brain or other system to start it beating. So that is the most beautiful part of it, which is autonomous. And we call it automaticity, which is, it is self-exciting. And this particular feature is used for another marvel of science, the heart transplantation. A brain dead person who has got the beating heart, we give a cardioplegia, stop this heart, take this heart out, transport hundreds of miles away, put it in a dying person who's dying of cardiomyopathy, and this heart starts beating for many, many years. This is such an amazing and fascinating fact. After that, suppose the organism faces some kind of threat and the brain, which is the, the father or the daddy, that asks the muscles to prepare either to fight the situation or run away from that situation. That means our muscles need more oxygen. And our mama heart does that by increasing the heart rate known as chronotropy. It has the ability to do that. Then increasing the conduction cause dromotropy and then increasing the excitability. So it uh, causes, uh, it becomes more excitable. So with all these three things, it kind of increases the cardiac output and is able to deliver that extra oxygen required for our muscles. A very important fact is that cardiac output or stroke volume of both left side and the right side are exactly identical. And they are very synchronous. They have to happen at the same time. For example, if there is a difference in the stroke volume of just one cc between the left and right ventricle, so that will become 70 cc is one minute if we are the heart is beating at 70 beats per minute, that becomes 4.2 liters and becomes about 100 liters in a day, which is totally incompatible with life. So that means within two to three cardiac cycles, the output of the two hearts has to be adjusted. That means there is some extra blood available either in the lungs or in the peripheries. <clears throat> At the same time, these two ventricles have to be synchronous to have the, the proper cardiac output and proper delivery of oxygen. Of course, we all know that the heart is uh, the pumping force. This is the best pump one can ever see or have, and we all have one. We are so lucky. So this is known as the inotropy or the force of contraction. Now, this heart will pump the blood, whatever it receives. If it receives more, it will try to deliver more. But if it receives nothing, it is not able to uh, deliver anything. For that, to receive the blood, it has to have another property, which is equally important called leucotropy or ability to relax. Only during this relaxation phase, it receives the blood and which prepares it for the next uh, systole so that we can eject blood in the next systole. So let us see what happens in adult cardiac uh, circulation, which is normal. After the blood, which is deoxygenated by utilized by all the tissues, comes back through the superior and inferior vena cava into the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, which pumps the blood into the pulmonary arteries through the pulmonic valve. And of course, the lungs are there to oxygenate this blood. 
and then the oxygenated blood goes to the pulmonary veins there are four pulmonary veins right superior right inferior left superior left inferior basically these four pulmonary veins form the posterior part of the left atrium and left atrium through the mitral valve gets again uh, sends the blood to the left ventricle and of course which pumps the blood through the aortic valve into the aorta and goes to the entire body entire cell receives this oxygenated blood and the cycle goes on and the life continues so when i ask even my residents here they cannot tell me what the pressures are inside the heart so to understand that if we remember these five things three things and we can calculate all the pressures the cvp generally is around 5 you can make it 6 or 7 whatever depending upon the the filling uh, pressure or the volume status the systemic blood pressure we take it as 120 over 80 mm of mercury we know that left ventricle has to push the blood from the toe to the head so all the body and whereas the right ventricle has to pump the blood only into the left and right part of the chest the right lung so the systemic vascular resistance is about 6 to 10 times more than the pulmonary vascular resistance that means the pulmonary pressure would be 6 to 10 times less than our systemic pressure so let us calculate the pressure inside the right ventricle we know the tricuspid valve opens during diastole so these two pressure should be equalizing that means the rv the end diastolic pressure is same as cvp which is 5 in this case we know during systole the this pumps blood through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary artery so pulmonary valve opens in systole so the pa systolic pressure should be same as the rv systolic pressure so the rv pressure normally say is between 20 mm systolic and 5 diastolic same on the left side the aortic valve opens in systole we know this aortic pressure is 120 which is a systemic pressure so in systole if there is no aortic stenosis the lv systolic pressure should be 120 what about the la pressure generally if we float the swan gans catheter and wedge it in one of the major pulmonary arteries the pressure or the column of blood downstream of this all the way up to the pulmonary veins and the left atrium is a stagnant because of the pulmonary capillary wedge and this gives you the la pressure or the pulmonary venous pressure or the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure in case we do not or we are not able to wedge or we do not want the uh, uh, pa catheter to wedge we generally take the pa cyst pa diastolic pressure as a surrogate of the la pressure so pa diastolic pressure is almost similar to la pressure given that there is no change in the pulmonary vascular resistance and there is no interference of uh, inter uh, intermittent positive pressure ventilation so with this we can calculate uh, all the pressures now if the, there is a pulmonary hypotension the pa pressure goes up rv starts to struggle then it pumps the blood of course tries to pump the blood into the lungs but some blood it goes backwards through the tricuspid valve causing tricuspid regurgitation tricuspid valve is the biggest valve in the heart if we check there is about 80% of the people general population you and me may have a trivial tricuspid regurgitation this is very common but with pulmonary hypertension this will become more a general thing we ask in our echo is patient has pulmonary hypertension 100% of the times the echocardiographer would have calculated the rv systolic pressure and not the pa pressure but again we know if there is no pulmonary synosis pa systolic pressure is same as the rv systolic pressure so this is how we calculate the pa uh, the rv systolic pressure now if we can somehow calculate the gradient between the rv and uh, uh, right atrial pressure and we add the cvp to that or the ra pressure to the gradient we can calculate the uh, rv systolic pressure we can calculate the velocity of this tricuspid regurgitation jet square it and multiply by 4 which i will discuss in my second talk about physics and we can calculate the rv systolic or the pa pressure okay so what happens sorry this is uh, something with my
okay when there is a pulmonary hypertension i simply classify into three forms the precapillary which can be because of hyperdynamic circulation as we see in end stage liver disease or it could be chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension then we can have pulmonary hypertension because of when the pvr is raised that is because of the lung problems and we can also have the post capillary also known as pulmonary venous hypertension which is because of the left side of the heart or left heart failure so we have for example a mitral stenosis less blood going into the ventricle during diastole through the mitral valve so the mitral the left atrium is enlarged has very high pressure and this causes back pressure in the pulmonary veins and all the way into the lungs causing pulmonary edema so uh, simply pulmonary hypertension is pre capillary capillary and post capillary there is another question that should we use peep for patients who has pulmonary hypertension if we see the pulmonary vascular resistance we have alveolar vessels and we have extra alveolar pulmonary vessels and they go in the opposite direction when the lung starts from the total collapsed state to the hyperinflated state but when you look at the total the pulmonary vascular resistance which is low it has the u shaped curve which is lowest at the level of functional residual capacity so i would advise to have at least the physiological peep to bring the lungs of the patient back to the functional residual capacity so that we have the lowest pvr another thing is heart failure we know that if a patient has heart failure the mortality is high but there is a figure of 35% ejection fraction if the ejection fraction is lower than 35% mortality is, is significantly higher than if the ejection fraction is more than 35% then we also know that we can have the ejection fraction with preserved uh, sorry heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in the past known as diastolic heart failure and we can also have uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction which is common in males compared to female whereas the diastolic heart failure is more prevalent in female especially elderly after age 70 years let us see how the muscle fibers are laid out in the myocardium so this is the mitral valve this is the aortic valve this is our lv we can see the fibers are both horizontal vertical and criss cross or circumferential and the blood comes to the mitral valve and it is pumped out into the aortic valve so if you look at this we have in the endocardium side we have the longitudinal fibers on the mid wall we have the horizontal fibers causing radial shortening and on the epicardial side we have the circumferential uh, fibers or the oblique fibers so this is a typical three different ways the myocardium contracts which is very peculiar and in a simple terms it is like wringing a wet towel so to squeeze the wet towel and this is your stroke volume so this is the typical uh, way the myocardium contracts now let us see if there is a dilated cardiomyopathy this towel which is wet becomes very large you can squeeze a towel which is of uh, say a average size but if this becomes a bed sheet and if you try to squeeze that you will not be able to uh, take out any water so this is what happens with dilated cardiomyopathy so there is a specific length of the myocyte or the sarcomere where you have the best force generation so this is a very interesting experiment uh, on animals so this is end diastolic and end systolic if the ratio is 1 is to 1 that means the myocardium is like a square or a cube and it is all blue that means there is not enough the generation of tension red in the picture would mean that there is maximum generation of uh, tension or force so when we make it 3 is to 1 that means the length is 3 times the uh, the width of the myocardium there is uh, still not enough generation of the force if it becomes 5 is to 1 there is now there is generation of force and ideal is if the length is 7 and the Uh, width is one. This causes the maximum generation of force. When we stretch it too much, elongate. This is in uh, dilated or any kind of uh, cardiomyopathy. This is stretched too much. Again, the force generation is lost. That means the fluid challenge will happen if we change from the 
sarcomere length from this to this. But if you give too much of fluid or there is dilated cardiomyopathy, we have no generation of force. Again, coming back to my uh, model of the heart, and let us see, we have a person, ejection fraction 60%, heart rate 80. So end diastolic volume of 100, that means with 60%, end systolic remains 40. So we have stroke volume of 60 ml, with multiplied by heart rate gives us 4.8 liters of uh, cardiac output. Now this person unfortunately develops an anterior septal myocardial infarction. With that, there is drop with ejection fraction to 40%. Remaining things all are the same. That is the heart rate still is 80 and diastolic volume still remains 100. But because it is 40% ejection fraction, so end systolic volume is a little bit high and only 40 cc's go out as a stroke volume and our cardiac output drops to 3.2 liters. The rest of the family or rest of the cells, they do not care what is happening to the heart. They cry for oxygen. They have to perform their own duties. And our uh, daddy and our mother, heart and the brain. What they can do is they increase the heart rate from 80 to make it 120. Ejection fraction still remaining 40%. Our cardiac output 40 multiplied by 120 gives us 4.8 back to normal. This is what the myocardium does initially in the very beginning by just causing tachycardia to have the oxygen supply to the rest of the body. The other way it can also do is it can have more of dilatation in itself. The end diastolic volume becomes 140. Initially, it was 100. So it has increased 40%. Now, ejection fraction is still 40%. So 40% 40 of 140 gives of 60 cc's and 60 multiplied 80 gives you 4.8 liters. So back to the normal situation. But in this case, the heart or the LV is already dilated. And this is uh, the sarcomeres are added in series here uh, to dilate because this is happening in diastole. It has to have extra blood in the diastole. And uh, so this is known as the eccentric uh, hypertrophy. So let us see what happens in MR or aortic regurgitation. With MR, there is extra blood which should be pumped into the aorta, but because of regurgitant uh, mitral valve, it goes in the LA and comes back during diastole into the LV. So there is an amount of blood which keeps circulating going to the LA, coming back to the LV. So this extra amount of blood causes dilatation of the LA, increasing the LA pressure, at the same time causing volume overload of the left ventricle. Same thing happens with aortic regurgitation. Some amount of blood leaks back through the leaky aortic valve, causing the volume uh, and the distension of the left ventricle and causing again the eccentric hypertrophy of the left ventricle. So let us see what happens with the aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis, this valve is very tight. It is difficult to eject blood into the systemic side. Again, our all our cells start crying. They don't care what is going on in the aortic valve. They need oxygen. Mama myocardium starts going to the gym and starts building up its muscles. It starts building up its biceps. With that, there is severe hypertrophy, but this is more of a concentric. With that decreases the inside volume of the heart. This is more of a concentric. It generates huge amount of pressure so that even through the narrowed aortic valve, some blood is able to cross the aorta and goes to the systemic side. So this is a type of concentric ventricular hypertrophy compared to the eccentric hypertrophy seen in the volume overload. So same thing, if the pressure overload versus volume overload, there is wall stress in the end systole. In the volume overload, it is during end diastole. There is a parallel replication of the sarcomeres, whereas in this, it is a serious replication of the uh, sarcomeres. This causes wall thickening with a decreased volume, and this causes wall dilatation with increased volume. So this is known as concentric hypertrophy, leads to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, whereas eccentric hypertrophy leads to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Two examples, very thick myocardium, very limited capacity for the volume. So this is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. 
this is heart failure this is a patient before the heart transplant with reduced ejection fraction another example of lv hypertrophy which is eccentric but in this case the function systolic function is normal and this is the concentric hypertrophy Another thing, lastly, I want to discuss is the Frank Starling's curve and fluid responsiveness of a patient. So if you are allowed me to draw a diagram, stroke volume on the y-axis and preload on the uh, x-axis, and we all know that this is a normal uh, Frank Starling's curve. That means that if our patient is somewhere here, he or she will respond to the preload, that means respond to the fluid challenge. So this part of... Uh, uh, sorry, so we can have a red line which is decreased Frank Starling, that means the check fraction is low, or we can have a hyperdynamic circulation. So this part of the curve is preload reserve. This patient has preload reserve. That means patients falling on this side of the curve will have high uh, pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation. They will respond to the passive leg, uh, leg raising and they will be fluid responsive. While patients on this side of the curve, they have low PPV and low SVV, they will not respond to a passive leg raising test and they will not be responding to any fluid challenge. So let us see this particular myocardium, which is big, dilated, not contracting very well. Where does this go? This probably will sit somewhere here. So we should not give this ventricle more volume or more vasoconstrictors. This needs inotropes. What about this ventricle, which is hypertrophic, good systolic function, but there is hardly any volume. So this would lie somewhere on this side and this ventricle should respond to the fluid challenge or the volume boluses. What about this ventricle? Good volume, good contractility, but this would lie somewhere on this side. So we should not give more volume if this patient becomes hypotensive. So that means this ventricle, which is almost normal and uh, more than normal volume, and this becomes hypotensive, vasoconstrictors in the form of norepinephrine or vasopressin is the choice. This ventricle, if this becomes hypotensive, this can happen with hokum, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or aortic stenosis, and becomes hypotensive, fluids is the only answer. This ventricle becomes hypotensive, inotropes is the only answer. And our target should be to have this kind of ventricle, which is contracting nicely. There is no regional wall motion. The volume status is also good. So if your patient collapses on table during anesthesia, so we have to quickly have, have answer to uh, our burning questions. First thing we have to rule out any tamponade or any pulmonary embolism. This is what you should be asking the cardiologist or the echocardiographer. Uh, to treat your patient. And what is the ventricular function? Both the right and the left ventricle, both systolic and diastolic and global as well as regional function. Then is your ventricle or uh, atrium dilated or hypertrophic? We know that hypertrophy does not happen overnight. It takes maybe months to a year before a, a, a chamber is hypertrophic. Then what is the volume status? Will it respond to the fluid challenge? Then what kind of valves we have? Is there any stenosis or regurgitation? And what is the severity of uh, the lesion? And lastly, some uh, miscellaneous things like, is there any acute aortic dissection? Is there a hokum present? Is there a takosubo kind of cardiomyopathy? Or is there is any shunt intracardiac present? So I think I'll finish that. And thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Achal Dir, sir. That was excellent presentation, I must say. And we all are going to get a lot of benefit out of it. And, um, and thank you for uh, making so many uh, points easy and clear with your uh, model. And uh, it was definitely um, very, very easy to understand uh, the whole cardiac physiology. We look forward to your next lecture as well. Uh, and over to you, Shiv, sir. What am I doing? Uh, I'm not doing any lecture. Okay. Uh, no, sir. <laughs> yeah. I just, uh... you know, yeah, you are. You're going to actually present. So, yeah. obviously, I need to introduce you, I think. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, oh, uh, where is that? Yeah.
let me at least share share the uh, screen. Oh, it's gone to. <laughs> Uh, it's not showing my PowerPoint at the minute. Oh, it's, it's here, it's here, it's here. No, no, it's here, it's fine, it's fine. So uh, next uh, person who's uh, going to present the talk is on transthoracic echocardiogram views. I think these are important, for, uh, especially for <clears throat> like journalists or people who are not from the cardiac uh, background. And uh, so this is going to be Amarya. So she's consultant cardiac anesthetist at uh, Kamal Nahan uh, Bajaj Hospital in Aurangabad. Uh, she actually is also founder of the Cardiac Anesthesia and Echocardiography uh, by Dr. Amarja. Uh, it's a Facebook group and it's uh, also got, I think got a, uh, have you got a YouTube channel? I, uh, YouTube, or Twitter? Like, uh, basically I have this yeah. website, no sir, Cardiac website, and yeah, yeah, Website, yeah, website is there on the uh, Facebook group. Yes. And for obvious reasons, uh, her main interest is cardiac anesthesia because she's a cardiac anesthetist. Uh, she's got uh, you know interest in echocardiograms, so she teaches transthoracic echocardiograms, uh, transesophageal cardiograms, and of course medical education. And that's why he she's here today. So over to you, Amarja. Thank you, sir, for <laughs> nice uh, introduction and. Uh... Let us start uh, with another very important topic. Uh, when we are learning uh, transthoracic echocardiography, we all have to uh, get acquainted with all the views and the windows of transthoracic echocardiography. Once you are acquainted with these views, you will get to know how easy actually transthoracic echocardiography is. Uh, if it doesn't move, uh, Amaya, just use the on the cursor on the uh, screen here. Uh, I have a disclaimer. Few pictures I've taken from uh, internet, and uh, as we all know, echocardiography is safe. It is totally non-invasive. It is repeatable. As many times you can repeat echocardiography for your uh, patient's uh, benefit, and. Uh, most importantly, it is real time. Whatever is happening inside the heart is on our screen. And uh, that is the um, basic um, advantage of echocardiography. Echo provides a substantial structural and functional information about the heart. It can be applied in perioperative period, intensive care units, in emergency situations, in trauma, and even it can be used in resuscitation uh, of, uh, uh, of any cardiac arrest patient. Echocardiography, it assesses the cardiac function by means of assessing its contractility, by assessing the chamber size and hypertrophy, it assesses valvular function, it uh, tells us if there is presence of cardiac tamponade or pericardial and even pleural effusions. Now there are basically only four uh, windows which uh, we have to know and these are the standard windows. Uh, this is the left parasternal uh, view then is the apical window, the subcostal window, and suprasternal window. These are the four important or the standard windows or the views which we have to know. And then there are many modified views. Uh, they have been modified to see each and every structure inside the heart. So by and large, you can see each and every structure inside the heart by modifying these four standard views. Now coming to the most important, that is the parasternal long axis view, which is also popularly called as PLAX, PLAX view. So in this, the patient is uh, positioned in left lateral position. Uh, the patient is given left lateral position because the heart is situated in on the left side uh, uh, of the chest and when you, when the patient is turned laterally it falls near the skin that is the only idea but uh, when you are uh, learning and uh, learning echocardiography or you are practicing echocardiography you need not always uh, have patient in the lateral position uh, in supine position also we can very well do uh, the echocardiography uh, so uh, once you place the position in left lateral uh, patient in the left lateral position place the transducer in the left third to fifth intercostal space near the sternum. If this is the sternum, on the left side of the sternum, in between third, third to fifth intercostal space, you have to place your transducer. And the orientation marker has to be towards the left shoulder. 
so here will be the left shoulder of the patient uh, sorry right shoulder of the patient and the orientation marker has to be towards the right shoulder of the patient the pilax view is the only view wherein the cursor or the orientation marker is towards the patient's right shoulder in all other views it can be either on the uh, towards the left shoulder or any other place but not in the patient's right uh, shoulder direction so the pilax view always orientation marker towards the patient's right shoulder so what all uh, can we see in the uh, parasternal long axis view the structures are see here is our cursor or our transducer and just beneath the transducer will be the rv so this has to be the posterior wall of the rv and this chamber is the right ventricle the next large chamber is the left ventricle left ventricle is opened um, the by the left atrium that means the left atrium opens into the left ventricle so this is the left atrium and this is the mitral valve situated over here here it is opened as the patient is in diastole and this is the anterior mitral leaflet this is the posterior mitral leaflet this lv then opens into the aorta so this has to be the left ventricular outflow tract the aortic valve and the ascending aorta here how do you know that uh, which uh, when is the patient in diastole and when in systole in diastole the lv feels therefore obviously the mitral valve has to be in opened up position so this has to be your diastole you can diagnose or you can uh, see it with the help of ecg also but in emergency situations if you do not apply ecg then this is one way how uh, it can be uh, diagnosed that uh, the patient's uh, lv is in diastole or systole during systole uh, the mitral will be closed and the aortic will be opened in this in this parasternal long axis view lv systolic activity or the systolic function can be assessed that is the ejection fraction dilatation and hypertrophy of all the chambers can be seen in this the interventricular septal hypertrophy can be diagnosed mitral valve and the aortic valve uh, functions can be uh, assessed in this then there is a uh, there is a i'll show you in the next slide the descending aorta is very well seen in the uh, seen in this pilax view so this is the descending aorta here and you can see this is a beautiful uh, picture of uh, pilax view wherein this is the lv hypertrophied uh, interventricular septum and posterior wall can be seen a bit and this is the descending aorta you can diagnose pericardial effusion as well as pleural effusion from this view any any dark collection of blood which is anterior to the descending aorta is always the pericardial effusion and that which is posterior to the descending aorta has to be the pleural effusion many times we see this and many times in cardiac patients you can diagnose pericardial uh, effusion as well as pleural effusion with this method now that was all about pilax view now comes psax view or the parasternal short axis view it is very easy once you get a nice frame in pilax view just position your transducer there there only where you get a beautiful pilax view and rotate it clockwise 90 degrees to get the short axis view and then uh, now you have to stop where when the patient, when the cursor or the transducer Uh, or say the orientation marker is towards the patient's left shoulder that is one where you can stop or you visualize a beautiful uh, image of the uh, parasternal short axis view there you have to stop and that will be your view and it will be of this type okay now uh, what are the structures that are seen in parasternal short axis view firstly it is very easy to uh, know the structures see here is our uh, transducer and this was our right ventricle if you remember in pilax view so this will be there only because we have just changed the from long axis to short axis the structures remain there only okay we are just seeing the short axis view of the same structures so this has to be the right ventricle and 
the right ventricle opens further with a pulmonary valve into the main pulmonary artery okay and previous to uh, uh, right ventricle is the tricuspid valve and the ra besides the ra in the heart or in the peri uh, 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 pericardial cavity lies la and this is the interatrial septum so the structures which are seen surrounding the aorta this is a tricuspid aortic valve in center and these are the la interatrial septum ra tricuspid valve rv rvot pulmonary valve and main pulmonary artery so these are the views uh, these are the structures which are seen in parasternal short axis view uh, this is particularly important if you are doing a case of uh, with involvement of aortic valve as such like ar yes and then you can know which are the leaflets that are involved in this this is particularly so in uh, when we uh, do um, operations on aortic valve itself uh, at that time this is very important but let me just tell you uh, this is very uh, easy to diagnose which are this uh, views because many patients you will get uh, to know that you even uh, come across uh, bicuspid valve uh, aortic valve so uh, that is why you just you should know that any any cusp which is adjacent to the interatrial septum is always the non coronary cusp the cusp which is adjacent to the rvot is the right coronary cusp and the other is the left coronary cusp so now now that was the parasternal short axis view now what is this parasternal basal short axis view so i would just like to uh, tell you that if this is heart hmm, this is the apex of the heart right when this is heart this is apex of the heart and this is the base of the heart so my transducer is here my transducer is here and now when it is here it is it is first it first we saw the parasternal long axis view then we turned it to 90 degrees and we came uh, in a position where we are seeing the parasternal short axis view when we are seeing parasternal short axis view first we saw with the aortic valve in center okay and then what we are doing now is we are tilting the transducer towards the left hip in such a manner that we are going to see all the structures in the mitral valve apparatus what are the structures in mitral valve apparatus they are the mitral valve itself which is situated at the base of the heart if this, this is apex this is called as the base of the heart where the mitral valve is situated then are the papillary muscles and then is the apex okay so the transducer is tilted towards the left hip and then the mitral valve is seen this is called as basal short axis view the next is further you tilt it downwards towards the patient's left hip again then you see the next that is the papillary mid papillary view which will be the next view the mid papillary view and further tilt will give you the basal apical short axis view so to get the whole range of parasternal short axis view you have to go from parasternal long axis view go 90 degrees and then just keep on tilting the transducer towards the left hip to see different mitral valve apparatus structures fine so now let me come again to this basal short axis view this is called as basal because it is situated at the base and that is the mitral valve which we see this is very important and why i told in so much detail is because you come across a lot of mitral stenosis cases yes and then the typical fish mouth appearance of this mitral valve can be seen um and uh, uh what 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 all uh, structures are seen in this view particularly is the mitral valve this is the anterior mitral leaflet the posterior mitral leaflet this is whole lv in short axis the interventricular septum and the rv okay so that was parasternal basal short axis view now further tilting of the transducer will show us papillary muscles so this is the anterolateral papillary muscle this is the uh, posterior medial papillary muscle now this is again a very important view why because you can diagnose regional wall motion abnormalities of the lv in this view now um, 
those who are new to what is regional wall motion abnormality or rwms let me just tell you in short this will be covered in detail in systolic function of the lv so i'll not go into the uh, types and uh, the uh, different uh, uh, what regional wall motion abnormalities are like uh, i'll just uh, give you a brief uh, uh, introduction of uh, regional wall motion abnormalities regional is pertaining to a region wall is wall of lv motion is related to movement motion and abnormalities so this is regional pertaining to some region regional wall motion abnormality of the lv so some lv wall a part of lv wall is not moving or is less moving so that is what we get to know from regional wall motion abnormalities now my uh, next slide will show us the same see in this particular in this particular uh, video if this is center and if the this is the lv which has to contract in the center towards the center is this is this moving towards the uh, towards the center forcefully or is it contracting well no it is not contracting well this is not the ejection fraction of 60% or 55% and above this is something i i should say 20 to 25% yes so this is global hypokinesia regional wall motion abnormality also has this hypokinesia and this is global hypokinesia this can be diagnosed well in this parasternal mid papillary short axis view another thing which can be diagnosed here is see if this is the center now you see both the papillary muscles are contracting and touching each other yes this is called as kissing papillary muscle signs and this systolic cavity or the cavity of the lv is obliterated during systole this is called as systolic obliteration of the lv cavity which means that there is no volume in the patient's lv the heart is empty that is why it is coming and it is touching each other so this this patient needs volume volume uh, therapy or this patient needs volume so that was importance of parasternal mid papillary short axis view now this is further tilting of the uh, transducer towards the um, left hip will give you the apex of the lv <clears throat> uh this is a video particularly i would like to tell you in this only uh the chambers or the see if you see which are the walls walls of lv i'll tell you in short this is the anterior wall okay this is the inferior wall now how why why this is anterior wall inferior wall how do you remember if you say i can't remember this i get confused when i see this so your transducer is here that is on the anterior chest wall isn't it your it is it is so easy that this wall your transducer is here on the anterior chest wall so this has to be anterior part of the lv right so if this is anterior part of the lv the opposite has to be the inferior part of lv yes this is the lateral yes this is the anterior part of lv this is the inferior part of lv this is the lateral part of lv and this is the septal i change this slide just to tell you that this is septal yes that is interventricular septum so this is anterior segment of the lv inferior segment of lv this is the anterolateral segment of lv this is the inferolateral segment of lv this is anteroseptal segment of lv and this is inferoseptal segment of lv got it this will be dealt in detail in uh, systolic function by minati madam this was just a overview of uh, uh, i i wanted to tell you to know the different uh, uh, to know the importance of this views now coming to uh, another window that is the apical four chamber view okay a uh, patient is again in supine uh, with the left lateral tilt or uh, in supine position also Uh, you can take the patient and uh, now the uh, transducer is kept in the fifth intercostal space in the left mid clavicular line or at the apex impulse 
the orientation marker will now direct towards the patient's left shoulder and what all you can see the larger globular structure is always or normally in a normal heart this is the lv okay the triangular structure the second largest say normally and the triangular is the rv okay rv also has a moderator band this thickened cord like structure is called as moderator band uh, which is um which is only present in the rv so this has to be the rv okay this is the right atrium the left atrium left atrium is known by its opening of the pulmonary veins okay this is the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve how do you know this tricuspid valve is situated little apically towards the apex than the mitral valve okay this is very important to diagnose the chambers when you are dealing with congenital heart disease patients okay so that was apical four chamber view and what do you assess in apical four chamber view is the ventricular function contractility dilatation of the chambers hypertrophy of the chambers and even pericardial effusion now what is apical five chamber view when you tilt anteriorly towards the patient's head like aorta comes out like this no towards the uh, anteriorly towards the head so you have to always direct uh, the transducer towards the head to open up the fifth chamber which is the aorta so this is the four um, lv the normal uh, apical four chamber view and when you uh, when you angulate your transducer towards the head you open up the fifth chamber fifth chamber that is the uh that, that is the lvot the aortic valve ascending aorta which is the aorta is opened that is called as five chamber view so this is the so this is the classical five chamber view when you very new open up the lvot aortic valve and the ascending aorta now two chamber view apical two chamber view now this transducer at the same position it is rotated counter clockwise from the apical four chamber uh, position till ra and rv disappear and only the la and L, uh, lv and la are seen okay these are the walls of the walls also now change that is the anterior wall and the inferior wall of the lv is seen this is again important in diagnosing rwms further uh, further uh, rotation of the uh, transducer counter clockwise will open up the aorta again and uh, these are the substitute views if you uh, don't get a beautiful one view you can just substitute uh, with other view and uh, out of two any one uh, even if you get uh, you are through now uh, subcostal view this is this this is a view wherein again all the structures will be seen now uh, in the previous views you saw it from the anterior part now you can see all the views from zp sternoid or or from 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 this level okay so all the structures can be can be viewed and uh, just you have to keep your uh, transducer uh, in the uh, subzipoid region and the indicator is now towards the 3 o'clock position here okay the four chambers that are displayed are this is the liver which will be seen and this is the ra rv la lv the interatrial septum interventricular septum mitral valve aortic valve okay and when you rotate the transducer counter clockwise and towards the left side yes you open up the inferior vena cava so this is the liver ra rv la lv and this is the inferior vena cava that is opening here fine to diagnose this as inferior vena cava you have to always see that it is connecting with the ra then and then only you diagnose it as ivc because why i am telling this particularly because aorta can also be seen and any novice can just confuse between the aorta and the ivc aorta is pulsatile ivc won't be pulsatile but ivc is collapsing which again you may uh, get confused so you you have to always see this or establish this connection of the ra with the ivc yes and then you can uh, see for the 
hypovolemia or hypervolemia or uh, you can diagnose rv dysfunction from the diameter of the ivc and the collapsibility of the ivc fine so this is the ra and this is the ivc now coming to the last view that is the suprasternal view the transducer is placed in the suprasternal notch with the transducer at 1 o'clock position and the structures that are seen are the aortic arch with the right brachiocephalic artery the common carotid artery the left subclavian artery the descending aorta the rpa and the la now uh, there are one or two only two modified views which i want to uh, tell you and uh, you have to take p lax view the first view p lax view and the transducer is rotated or is tilted sorry towards the Uh, right hip of the patient to see the rv so here is the rv ra this is also called as bicaval view because the svc and the ivc are seen here and um, the tricuspid is seen this is the rv inflow view the next view is the rv inflow outflow view this is again a modification of the uh, parasternal short axis view wherein we saw this uh, pulmonary valve and in this you can see the uh, pulmonary valve the main pulmonary artery the rpa and the lpa this is particularly important in pulmonary embolism cases so this is the pulmonary valve here and you can see the lpa and the rpa here lpa is seen nicely in this video so uh, that was all about uh, transthoracic view and its uh, views and its importance for uh, us um, visit my website cardiacanasir.in and that was all uh, for today from my side uh, thank you thank you so much for having me Yeah, I think Dr. Nima wants to um, give us some tips, or I think he's got some uh, thing to say to us. Dr. Nima, um, I will just uh, spotlight you. Over to you, sir. Uh, audio, audio, sir. Switch on the audio, please. Your audio is off. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Very oh, clear. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, Dr. Shiv. Sir, uh, nice to see you, sir. Uh, good evening, Dr. Amarja. Good evening, Dr. sir. Dr. Achal, long time uh, after very long time, Dr. Achal. <laughs> and yes, Dr. Narendra Prasad and so on, everyone. Okay. Uh, I do not know. Uh, I understand that the you see the presentation is for. Uh, uh, Anesthet anesthetist who are dealing with non cardiac surgery that's right and uh, probably most of them uh, they may not be really very well acquainted with the anatomy of the heart yep so this is the for understanding all the views of the heart okay whether you go whether it is transthoracic or it is transesophageal very important to understand the anatomy of the heart. Yeah. and my suggestion is that whenever you show whichever view you are showing the view it is better if you can show the an underlying anatomical view also hmm. i think that would make the you see the understanding easier for those who are not doing it uh, routinely regularly one thing and uh, secondly see the from the point of view of uh, see the non cardiac uh, Uh, population. I mean, those who are not dealing with cardiac surgeries. Mm. Uh, what matters more is uh, uh, one is important is the contractility of the heart. Yeah. Uh, number two, the volume status too. And maybe if suppose some acute problem like acute mitral regurgitation is there. Mm. So this is where we normally concentrate. Uh, when you are dealing in uh, non cardiac surgical patients that's right sir. so that is where uh, means i would try to not to you see the uh, make the audience a uh, bit confused with the views mm -hmm. and uh, i would concentrate only on these three views and the under underlying anatomy so that they really understand that with the eco machine what they should be doing if suppose mm -hmm. there is problem in operation theater Are in the post-operative area. Yeah. This one. Uh, secondly, I wanted to add about. You, know, you said that there can be confusion 
about uh, whether you are dealing with whether the underlying structure is aorta or it is inferior vena cava see one can always put in a doppler there if it is continuous flow again it is little more you see the little more for, from the general anesthesia people but if suppose they know of uh, echo just put in the uh, put in the doppler you know immediately whether it if it is uh, systolic flow only so it is aorta and if it is continuous flow it is you know that is the underlying structure is a vena cava i think that is all from my side uh, others say. thank you dr nema um, good morning kater minati and dr ajal anything to add to hi uh, good morning everyone um, thank you morning sir for giving me opportunity here and uh, you know i'm delighted to be here um so i think um when you talk transthoracic echo I, it's important to draw a line um, between what a general anesthesiologist can do um what they should not be doing um so <clears throat> you know there are two divisions like uh, tee uh, you do have a basic tte and you should have basic tte is nothing but focus mm. you know so they like focus or focus they call it as and mm. the advanced tte is something uh, which somebody who have experience in doing cardiac echo for years and years should be doing like diastolic function uh, or a gradients across the aortic valve to um, you know diagnose aortic stenosis Uh, those things should be done by uh, advanced echocardiographer so for example you may learn to do gradient across the aortic valve uh, but you may not be good enough to interpret unless you have that ex- experience because in aortic stenosis as you know there are 100 types of aortic stenosis you have a low gradient pseudo gradient you know so if you uh, assume that this is low gradient and no aortic stenosis you may be wrong in several circumstances so mm-hmm. I, i believe we need to draw a line i think in simple approaches um tte for a general anesthesiologist uh, should be uh, for diagnosing hypovolemia for uh, diagnosing ventricular dysfunction uh, a gross it is normal or abnormal you should not be say taking 10% 20% or you should be qualitatively able to say whether it's normal or abnormal and is there any gross valvular pathology like you have you know valve looks abnormal versus valve look normal that is one thing you want to say you have calcium in the valve uh, there could be some abnormality so that somebody else can follow up a detailed exam number 4 the uh, important thing in non cardiac surgical patients is pericardial effusion so these four things you should be able to tell hypovolemia gross ventricular dysfunction um, you know gross valvular abnormalities and pericardial uh, problems so more than this anything you want to do you need a little bit of advanced training i'm not saying general anesthesiologist cannot reach that phase Uh, you should keep working on this for years and years and pile on numbers of patients then you will be good enough to do an advanced echo so that's my um uh, point i think that that point is i think uh, very valid because uh, like <laughs> to be to be frank uh, most of us uh, would actually just look at a cardi- echo cardiograph report Uh, we ask for it's part of the preoperative assessment uh, for patients who have got any cardiac history we would actually look at that and it would be nice to actually also point out as a part of the symposium when you're looking at a, a echocardiogram re- report what you need to concentrate on what are the points which will actually be red flags for you because a lot of times it's a, uh, like for us it's a technician report it's not seen by a cardiologist it's not reported by a cardiologist is reported by a technician artillers i mean they find something very unusual they don't technically go to a cardiologist mm. so all those there are a huge number you uh, know uh, amount of data in the report 
and what is the thing which actually should be important to us that's i think uh, would be very useful for a lot of uh, the anesthetist okay shall we move on then yes yes sir i i i also sorry uh, i also put a article in the chat box um, okay. i'm ha i'm happy to send anyone um, we he have some guidelines for transthoracic echo training um, and what are the views to do in basic and advanced may be helpful for somebody who wants to learn uh, transthoracic echo but definitely uh, sue's point is extremely important the point of this forum should be to focus on how to interpret a echo report when you receive it uh, rather than doing an advanced echo exam um, you know for general anesthesiologist yeah. yeah i think i think the again like you pointed out uh, it's the like if you're using an uh, echocardiogram i mean the graphy for in our setup, in the anesthesia, general anesthesia setup, we usually is part of a focus. And so that's, that's but I think uh, uh, it was very clear the way uh, Amarja has actually explained, you know, where to place a pro, what you need to look at. And uh, people should be at least be able to actually uh, do those, uh, you know, simple uh, examinations of the car and, and probably get some idea, some idea about what are you looking at. Yes. Uh, right. So, uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you for your inputs, uh, Dr. Neema, sir, and uh, Kathrival, sir. And um, Kathrival, sir, uh, uh, please post uh, the link of your recent publication in JCVA uh, on our WhatsApp group or on the Facebook group, and we will forward it to everyone. And also the eco program uh, link as well. And uh, now moving to the uh, third uh, talk of uh, today's session, that is physics and basic principles of ultrasound. Uh, once again, by Dr. Achal Deer, sir. And uh, over to you, sir. Thank you again very much. After a very enlightening discussion, on uh, transthoracic echo. So I'll again go back to the basics, a peek inside the human heart, and I'll just discuss the very basic physics and principles around ultrasound. So for the many generations, the equipment on the left, we have been using it and still use it. Many of us have already started using bedside ultrasound and in near future, I think in our generation itself, I will see that uh, uh, many of our physicians will carry their iPhone and a small probe and uh, do the ultrasound wherever required. So I'm going to discuss what type of B ultrasound. This is a B mode that is a brightness mode. There is another one called amplitude mode or A, which is not used. I'm just talking about the brightness mode of ultrasound. So I'll discuss about what is M mode what is a 2D or two-dimensional ultrasound? We usually see it as a movie. Dr. Amraja already, already showed us many views uh, of the moving heart. And I will not discuss about the 3D uh, echo, which is becoming or has become quite popular uh, in the cardiac surgical domain. I will then discuss about the spectral Doppler, what is pulse wave and what is continuous wave, what is the confusion and what is a color flow Doppler. Then again, I will not discuss about the tissue wave Doppler, which again becomes a little bit a high fi for a general practitioner who is not dealing with cardiac anesthesia. So anything which happens once a second, the frequency is one, is known as one hertz or one cycle per second. If it is thousand times per second, it is known as one kilohertz, a million times per second known as one megahertz. So a probe transducer which has five megahertz means that it sends uh, the ultrasonic uh, waves at five million cycles per second. We know that the velocity of sound in any human tissue generally on an average is constant. So whenever there is high frequency, there is a decreased wavelength. That generally improves the quality or the resolution of the picture, but on the other hand, uh, you suffer at the penetration of uh, the ultrasound. 
So a sound is a mechanical longitudinal wave and it makes the medium vibrates. That means we have to have a medium and the medium particles vibrate and that uh, come to our ear and we hear it as a sound. If there is no medium like uh, a vacuum, there will not be any sound wave. So we know that the human ear can have capacity of hearing at the frequencies between 16 to 20 kilohertz, that is 20,000 per second of the waves. Anything below 15 is known as infrasound and anything above 20 kilohertz is known as ultrasound, which is the topic of our discussion. So in average human soft tissue, the velocity of sound and ultrasound is about 1.54 kilometers per second, which is pretty fast. So we can have a good picture if we know how to harness the, the use of ultrasound. So when an ultrasound hits a medium of different densities, the waves or the uh, ultrasound can be reflected back and which gives us the picture. If there is no reflection, we cannot have a picture. Some of the ultrasonic waves like a light beam in the water will be refracted. And if there is another tissue or some particle there and it reflects the wave back and that usually gives us some artifacts. So we need to understand exactly what we are looking at and we need to know what different artifacts, which I'm not going to discuss. Then some of the waves, especially the very small particles like the RBCs, they scatter these ultrasound waves in all different directions. And of course, some of them will be reflected back and we will use that for Doppler uh, interrogation. Many waves are absorbed and they are attenuated. The heart in any ultrasound is the piezoelectric crystal, which is either a quartz or a ceramic crystal. The beauty of that is when you apply an electric current to this crystal, it starts vibrating in a very fast speed in the range of ultrasonic waves, which sends ultrasonic waves in uh, all directions. If the crystal is very small, it vibrates at a higher frequency compared to a crystal which is thick, which uh, vibrates at a lower frequency. So there is an ultrasound machine sends the electric uh, signal to the piezoelectric crystals, which generate ultrasound, which goes to the tissues. The another beautiful part of this piezoelectric crystal is when the ultrasonic waves hit back onto the piezoelectric crystal, it generates it into an electric current or electric waveform and which can be interrogated and made a picture out of it. So a typical transducer may contain about 128 to 256 of these piezoelectric crystals, also known as elements. Now a group of piezoelectric material can work together singly or in groups. So like in a linear array probe, it works as groups in, in sequential and the phased array probe, it all works together, but we can electrically change the direction of this particular array or the ultrasonic wave. A typical example, let us have an example. We have 10 elements or 10 piezoelectric crystals in the probe, and one sector line is created by activating three elements. So first we have activated element one, two, three, after that, two, three, four, three, four, five, so on and so forth, until we have activated all, all the last crystals, eight, nine, and 10. That means the total number of lines would be 10 minus three plus one. That means this uh, section will have eight lines of ultrasound to interrogate this particular uh, tissue. So coming to the transducers, we know that these crystals will send electron, sorry, the ultrasonic waves in all directions. So there is a backing material shown here as yellow. So that, that will prevent the ultrasound going backwards. So there is an acoustic insulation on the rest of the probe. And there is an acoustic lens, which kind of focuses the ultrasonic uh, waves. The maximum resolution is at the point where these, uh, uh, the lens kind of focuses the probe. Uh, the after field and the near field will have not as good a resolution. We know that there are different types of probes, basically three linear, curvilinear, and phased array, and how these work. 
So what kind of picture do we see on the monitor? We can see from the, just looking at the monitor at what kind of probe is being used. The linear probe will give you a rectangular picture. This usually has very high frequency. That means a very high megahertz. With that, it can give you only a certain depth of uh, the interrogation, but the picture quality and resolution is, is the best. The curvilinear probe is usually used for deeper structures like an obstetrical ultrasound. It usually has a little bit lower frequency, but on the other side, which gains the depth or the penetration. The quality is a little bit compromised. If we have a picture, and in this case, we have on the top of the screen, uh, there will be like a curve there. Uh, if we are using a phased array probe, which Dr. Amro just showed, we'll have a typical pie-shaped picture a very narrow angle, a narrow point at the top and increasing in uh, depth and width. So a typical linear probe, which is high frequency, which is good for resolution and used for superficial structures. And because it has less penetration as the, the wavelength of the ultrasound is very small, so they cannot penetrate deeper structures. And on the top, we have this rectangular uh, type of picture. The curvilinear, all the elements are arranged again in a li linear fashion, but the probe is curved. So you will have a curve at the top of uh, the picture, but it can interrogate very deep structures. So good penetration at the compromise of less resolution. Then the phased array. Phased array, we have two which have a very small footprint. That means this is the transphoracic probe, which can look between the two ribs or from the suprasternal notch. Uh, so it has a very small uh, footprint. Even the smaller is the transesophageal uh, echo probe. These piezoelectric elements are attached onto a gastroscope. The advantage of transesophageal echo is we can push the probe into the stomach from esophagus. We can pull it out. We can rotate to the right, rotate to the left physically with the hand, or there are two knobs here. One bigger knob can anti-flex or retroflex the probe depending upon how we use it. The smaller knob also can right flex or left flex. And then there is also a small dot here. We can have, that is the crystal angles. We can change the angle. So we can cut the heart in any way we want from vertical to horizontal to longitudinal to long axis to short axis. So transesophageal echo, we can manipulate the crystals in the probe, whereas in transthoracic, we have to do it by hand or manual, which Dr. Amraja just mentioned. So this type of picture we will see that is there is a pie, uh, small narrow point there and kind of increasing in width and depth. So how we electronically steer uh, the ultrasound wave. If we uh, activate all the elements together, this will give you a vertical wave front. If we activate this crystal at the bottom first and on the top at the last, so if this crystal is activated first, it gets sends its ultrasound, then the second, then the third. So this means the wave front would be a little bit onto the uh, this direction. If we activate the outer crystals first, then the inner crystal uh, in inner ones, this will be focusing the uh, ultrasound wave in a narrow way and in this direction. So in this way, we can kind of uh, engineer or steer our angle of the ultrasound wave. Again, another example, if we activate this crystal first on the left and the uh, last on the right, the wave front is in this direction. So we are interrogating this heart of the uh, patient of this side. Then we change uh, the activation of the crystals all crystals are activated at the same time, then the wave front becomes this, then we interrogate this part of the heart. Then we activate this crystal first on the right and last activation is on the left crystal, wave front changes to the opposite direction. Now we're interrogating this side of the heart. This is how a 2D image of the heart is generated. Just another example again. So this is what happens one, send, next, 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 and the entire picture is formed. Uh, look at uh, uh, the number here, which is 52 hertz, which is the frame rate. So resolution is 
all depending upon the frame rate. If you are of my generation, you may have seen those flipping books in which uh, there was a cartoon and which was just saluting with the right hand. So there was about 50 pages and in each page, there was a slight movement of his right hand, slightly more in the next, slightly more in the next. And if you flip all these pages suddenly, you will see that if the cartoon is giving you a salute. And this so happened that each frame was the each page of that. And if you flip it very quickly, and if the frame rate is more than 16 frames per second, the human visual cortex believes it to be as a moving picture. So all those movies are made, they will have a frame rate of more than 16, then our brain perceives it as a moving structure. The new Hollywood movies, of course, generally they are 24 frames per second or could be 48, which is very high resolution movies. So this is how a picture is made. First, we have a picture, then within, uh, within a millisecond, next second picture. After that, the next picture, you move it very fast. It looks like a moving heart. So the frame rate is very important for the temporal resolution. The another resolution is known as axial resolution. That is, if there are two dots very close to each other, and if they are cut by just one ultrasound beam, they will be shown as one big structure. So to improve the quality of this and to demarc it as two separate structures, the frequency has to be very fast so that ultrasound wave uh, wavelength is very small. So this is cut in two wavelengths. So that means to improve the Excel resolution, you have to have high frequency, low wavelength ultrasound. If there are two structures lying side by side on the left and on the right, and for that, it depends on how many widths, how many lines in this sector we have. Ada has given an example of eight lines. So if this both these structures come in one line, that will be seen as one big dot on your screen. But if you have more lines coming up, so each line has a separate uh, this structure. So for lateral resolution, we have to have more number of lines in each uh, sector. Another example, if we have a structure just at 10 centimeters versus a structure at 20 centimeters, of course, simple physics, it will take double the time for the ultrasound to reach there. Of course, we're talking about that milliseconds, but again, if you have more depth, it will take more time for the ultrasound to go and then to be reflected back. So to improve the resolution of your picture, you can decrease the depth of your uh, uh, field and you just have the, you just focus the area of interest, which is visual in that, which is a scene. And you can also decrease the, the sector width from left to right so that uh, your number of lines are more concentrated and you focus on that. This is how you can improve the resolution of the picture. Coming to the M mode, M mode is a different modality. So there is only one line through which the ultrasound goes in and is reflected back out or just one line. In this case, either the paper on the old screens or the uh, old machines or in newer cases, the screen moves from left to right but the ultrasound just focuses on one line. So as we know, it is going at 1.54 kilometers per second. So you can see the quality of resolution. M mode is still used uh, in the present day also, if we want to identify how the mitral valve is opening or closing or how the aortic valve, or in this case, how the papillary muscle, this is a trans esophageal probe is in the esophagus, which is behind the heart. So the first structure to come, which is just opposite what Dr. Amraja told, would be the posterior structure. This is a posterior mitral, uh, sorry, posterior papillary muscle, and this would be the anterior structures of the heart. We can delineate the antisystolic and diastolic dimensions and calculate ejection fraction. Coming on to the Doppler effect, we know that if we are speeding and if there is a radar camera or the policeman is standing, he has to stand either in front of the car or behind the car to have a proper uh, angle of uh, incidence. Radar works on the basis of radio waves, but we're talking about ultrasound, the basic principles remain the same. So any sound of an object moving towards you will have a higher pitch than the sound moving away from you. This we know from our high school physics. Uh, 
This happens only by changing the frequency. When the car approaches us or a moving train approaches us, we feel that the sound is becoming more. It is just by increasing the frequencies. If it is going away from you, the frequencies become less and less. And this is how we perceive as uh, the sound becoming diminishing. So this change in frequency, which is known as Doppler shift is used in a Fourier uh, equation and is used to calculate the velocity of the blood or velocity of the train or velocity of your car before you get a ticket. The best estimation of flow as I discussed is at an angle of zero or at an angle of 180. This is from the Doppler equation, which I'm going to discuss just now. If there is no flow, whatever the frequency was sent in, they're reflected back the same amount. So there is no shift in the Doppler flow uh, uh, frequencies. If the object or the blood is moving towards the transducer, it will be shown as positive on your screen. If it is going away from the transducer, it will be shown as a negative waveform. But if it is coming towards the transducer, it will increase the frequencies as we just discussed as approaching train will have a high, higher uh, sound. So this increase uh, can be calculated. Again, another uh, important thing, if you have seen somebody doing the Doppler, you can actually listen that. And the student asks, why can we listen when we are talking about ultrasound? It is the change of that frequency, which is coming into now the audible range, which you can see if you put a probe on somebody's uh, radial artery or any big artery, you can hear the sound whoosh, whoosh. That is the change in the frequency, which is not at the level of ultrasound, which you are hearing. But we calculate this change. If the blood is moving away from the transducer, of course, there will be less number of uh, frequency of wavelength coming back to you. So this we can calculate by Doppler shift. This is the equation, of course. We don't need to know that. The computer does it. And in a very simpler form, the velocity is calculated. If we know the Doppler shift, we know what is the transmitted frequency and the angle is very important. And if you know, if we have the probe directly at 90 degrees across the vessel, you will not hear the sound. You will not able to calculate any velocity because the cos sine of uh, angle 90 is zero and everything becomes zero. So you have to have an angle at zero degree or at 180 degrees. What is a pulse wave Doppler? In this case, there is a same crystal which sends the ultrasound, then waits and receives the same uh, reflected ultrasound uh, and uh, the change in the frequency. There is a sample volume. Uh, in this case, it is somewhere here this one and it measures the velocity at this particular area so if you know what you are uh, looking at this i have put the cursor at the lvot a left ventricular outflow track and this will very accurately measure the velocity in this particular lvot at a very specific spot but the problem with this is because the same crystal is used it can only calculate very low velocities and if you look at the picture, this is the last piece of it. So the blood flow is moving away from the transducer. So you have a negative deflection from the horizontal uh, line. And if you look at the pulse wave Doppler, it is usually hollow. You just have one line. But you can calculate in this case, it is uh, 72 centimeters per second, which is absolutely normal. And you can calculate the velocity and the pressure gradients. What is the continuous wave Doppler? This is the same Doppler, but now it's one crystal which is continuously sending the signal, whereas another crystal which is continuously listening. With this, we can measure a very high velocity. In this case, the velocity is 5.5 meters per second, which we usually we can see in the aortic synotic valve. So this measures very high velocity. And the problem is we cannot know where exactly this high velocity occurred which will tell you the maximum velocity, which happened across this red line. Now, with this, I can only calculate the maximum velocity, but I do not know whether that happened in the LVOT or that happened in the aorta or at the level of aortic valve. We just presume that the synotic aortic valve will cause the maximum velocity, and that is why the peak velocity will occur at the level of the aortic uh, stenosis or at the level of aortic valve. 
that is the problem. There is a range ambiguity, which is not there with the pulse wave Doppler. There is a good thing with this is known as no aliasing, which was there with pulse wave Doppler. With the pulse wave, if you are trying to interrogate this high velocity, it will cause aliasing. If you see an old Western movie in which uh, if uh, you focus on the car, which is moving forward, but the car tires are the horse driven cart, the wheels appear to be moving backwards. This is exactly what happens when the velocity is more than the picture taking capacity. The entire thing becomes opposite and you feel as if the flow is moving uh, opposite to the normal physiological flow, which does not happen with continuous wave Doppler. So whenever we are interrogating high flow velocities, we use the co continuous wave and where we're interrogating low velocity signals, we may use the pulse wave Doppler. What is the color flow Doppler? This is basically a form of a pulse wave Doppler, which is given as eight or 10 or 20 different pulse waves uh, signals combined together. Again, it is prone for aliasing because it is a pulse wave Doppler. And instead of giving the velocity, we color code the signal. That means each dot of the pulse wave will have a color coding. Then there is a former known as BART, which is blue away, red towards. Of course, we can change that, but generally speaking, any blood which is flowing away from the transducer in the pulse wave was shown as a negative deflection waveform. In this case, it's shown as blue color of the blood, which is going away from the transducer. In this case, this is the left atrium. This is the mitral valve. This is the left ventricle. So in the diastole, the blood is going down as a blue. And systole, this LV pumps the blood, and this is the aorta, this is the aortic valve, is pumping the blood as red, as is moving kind of towards the transducer. We can also see a small jet of aortic incompetence, which is usually a turbulent flow, which is known as different mosaic colors. Coming to a, another very important principle known as Bernoulli principle, which is used almost always in uh, transthoracic or uh, transesophageal echo. The principle is that whenever there is a constriction with that, the flow has to accelerate to this narrow constriction. And as the velocity increases and maintaining the principle of uh, uh, conservation of uh, energy, something has to give. In this case, the pressure drops. You also understand the venturi principle when you increase the velocity, there is a negative pressure. So similar thing, Bernoulli principle says, whenever there is constriction, the velocity goes up, the pressure drops. This is used to calculate the aortic valve area by using continuity equation, but more importantly, the the pressure gradients, which in my first talk, I mentioned about the calculating the RVSP from the tricuspid jet uh, uh, flow. So this is a confusing uh, Bernoulli principle. We do not need to remember that. There is a modified one. So V1 and V2 is the one which is after the constriction. So V2 will be more than the V1. Normally we know inside the heart, the velocities are either one or less than one meter per second. So this is insignificant in most of the times. We can use a simplified Bernoulli equation, which is just four V square. So we calculate the V2, we square it, multiply by four, which gives you the pressure gradient between this chamber and in this chamber. So in the tricuspid regurgitation, if this was your uh, uh, right atrium, there is a jet flow velocity to the uh, tricuspid regurgitant flow. And we calculate the velocity, we square it, multiply by four, and we add CVP or right atrial pressure. That gives you the pressure in the right ventricle, which is the pulmonary uh, systolic uh, pressure. In some cases, rarely when there is a LVOT obstruction, like there is a hokum or there is hypertrophic, or there is an aortic membrane, there may be increased velocity, which is as V1. In those rare situations, we should use modified, but I'm sure this is beyond the use of our uh, uh, target audience. So I'm not going to confuse them. So basically four V square, you calculate velocity with the Doppler, square it, multiply by four, you can calculate the pressure in different chambers of the heart. Giving you example, this is the tricuspid uh, regurgitant velocity, which was 3.3 centimeters squared, multiply by four, gives you 45 millimeters, add the CVP to that, 
gives us the RVSP of this patient, which I was doing is 73 millimeters of mercury. So this patient had pulmonary hypertension. Again, a different view in the transesophageal echo, calculating the aortic stenosis uh, interrogation. Velocity was 5.5 meters per second. Square it, multiply by four, gives you the maximum gradient across this aortic valve of 122. That means a very severe aortic stenosis. Last part, there are some other physical principles involved. One is the Kawanda effect, which is usually seen in the mitral regurgitation. That means there are some eccentric jets of the mitral regurgitation, which look very small, but those who do it every day, they understand that any wall hugging jet, which looks very small and eccentric, they have so much of energy that they are kind of stuck to the one wall of the left atrium, either this side or this side, depending upon where the direction of the, the mitral regurgitation jet is. So any small, looking but wall hugging jets of mitral regurgitation should be thoroughly and carefully investigated. And that is because of the Coanda effect. We also have the continuity equation. Just in a nutshell, we can calculate aortic valve area, stroke volume and cardiac output. We can calculate ejection fraction by, as I mentioned, M mode. We have the end systolic dimension. We have the end diastolic dimension. And we can calculate uh, the fraction shortening and then the ejection fraction. Same with the symptoms rule of DIST, we can calculate ejection fraction or LV volume and LA volume. So we can do lots of things with the use of different physical principles, the Doppler, the Bernoulli equation, and we can have the physiology, the anatomy and pathophysiology of the heart. Thank you again very much for your time and uh, attention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Achal Deer, Deer sir, uh, for the excellent talk and uh, all our uh, physics uh, and the basic principles uh, are cleared. And uh, the best thing about uh, today's uh, symposium is that it will always be present on the YouTube. So uh, fellows and anyone of us, uh, whoever wants to brush up again with the uh, these topics uh, can always go on uh, to this YouTube uh, link. And uh, we can just uh, go through uh, these excellent lectures. And thank you, Achal Deer, sir, for uh, both the topics uh, very well explained today. Thank you so much. And now uh, moving on to the third uh, or the fourth topic, uh, that is the assessment and clinical implications of systolic function uh, by Dr. Minati Chaudhary. And um, she is the uh, professor uh, in cardiac anesthesia and critical care department of uh, AIMS, New Delhi. And she has special interests in cardiac anesthesia, critical care, echocardiography, medical education, and research. Uh, over to you, Minati, madam. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amarjia. So in the next couple of minutes, we are going to discuss the, how we are going to assess and what are the clinical implications of the LV systolic function. So... Um, I got four images from uh, the internet and uh, there is no conflict of interest. So the main learning objectives of this lecture, the student will learn, remember what are the causes of LV systolic dysfunction, how to interpret the echo finding to study LV systolic function and dysfunction. Third, how serious is your patient according to the echo report and what are the steps to prepare a case based on echo finding what are the special precautions you are going to take in the perioperative period if the patient is having ventricular dysfunction and how to deal with the emergency? So at the end, we are going to discuss two cases. The first case is 45-year-old male hypertensive, which is chronic, and came for resection of anterior mediastinal mass with an ejection fraction of 23%. And um, he has a number of findings on his ECO report. And the second case is 33 year uh, female second gravida obese having idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy since the last 12 days and posted for elective seizure and section. So first of just remember what are the causes of LV systolic dysfunction. It can be myocardial ischemia, acute MI, systemic inflammation, cardiomyopathy, which is again very common, especially after trauma and idiopathic cardiomyopathy in the pregnancy. Sepsis is again very common cause of ventricular systolic dysfunction in the ICU. Uh, 
hypocalcemia and uh, CAD, severe hypertension, cardiac valvular heart disease. Again, we are getting a lot of cases uh, for non-cardiac disease. Uh, having heart valve disease, they might have left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Again, cancer is very common. So also chemotherapy and these are many of these patients have LV systolic dysfunction and some uncommon causes like hypothyroidism and pheochromocytoma. So now come how to study and interpret the findings. So there are several parameters to study the LV systolic function. But however, some are common and some are advanced, some are intermediate and some are uh, individual choice as well for uh, research interest or uh, inquisitiveness of the students. So very common are to look uh, eyeballing of the size of the uh, LV, ejection fraction, the cardiac output, cardiac index and global longitudinal strain. Some people go for fractional area shortening, fractional area change, and DP by DT, that is the pressure change for time, and uh, myocardial performance index and uh, tissue Doppler imaging are very uncommon. And if one can go for advanced echo, they usually do it. And uh, EPSS and uh, MAPC, there are also some parameter. And some people go for that for uh, EG to know the ejection fraction. So what is more important to study before you go for the LV systolic dysfunction? The first is important is you go for a good and accurate measurement. For this, you have to do for a proper image optimization. So you can see there are three set of image. The first thing you can hardly see anything and hardly recognize anything. Second, you can see something, but it is difficult how to measure which point is what. And third image is very clear. So you can see each and every point, you can uh, see the wall and uh, you can see the systole and diastolic side. So how to go for this? A patient positioning is very, very important and Dr. Amarja repeatedly highlighted the left lateral position of the patient. And secondly, you have to adjust the machine setting that is the frequency, gain, sector width, scale, focal point, etc. So after you got the image, the grossly you look for the LV size. Normally, uh, it is normal and it is increasing the systolic dysfunction. So there are three methods of measurement. One is volumetric measurement. And secondly, you can uh, measure the diameter or area, usually the long axis diameter. And these are the normal values for the diameter, uh, for the LV systolic diameter, LV diastolic diameter. And for the LV systolic uh, volume and uh, roughly is 20 to 60 ml in gross and diastolic is 65 to 150 ml. And any alteration from that, that means your patient is going towards some kind of dysfunction. So in this, uh, you can see the LV area is measured in the diastole and it is a uh, systole that is the smallest uh, diameter, same LV axis also in both the condition and LV volume also and how it changes from diastole to systole. And what is again important, ECG is a must for all kind of measurement. Next, the most common measurement is ejection fraction. What is ejection fraction? It is a percentage of the blood that is pumped out of the ventricle with each heartbeat. So this is basically measured in the echo. You have to measure the end diastolic volume, whatever blood is there, minus the end systolic volume divided by the end diastolic volume into 100 because it is uh, depicted in percentage. So usually there is a different school of thought is different, but in an average 55 to 65% ejection fraction, if it is written in your echo chart, that considered to be the normal. And if it is severely impaired, that means it is less than 30% and mildly impaired 40 to 50 and 30 to 40 is moderately impaired. There is some condition like hyperdynamic in uh, that is more than 70 is the ejection fraction. This is especially patient who have hyperdynamic cardiac output state. So what is the common method to measure? Mostly you have to take two views, apical four chamber view and the apical two chamber view. Keep the patient in the steep left lateral decubitus position to get a good image. So in the apical uh, two chamber view, you have to be very sure that your aortic valve is not visible and there should not be any papillary muscle as well is visible. 
and uh, what is the end diastolic frame so that frame is uh, mainly the frame following the metal wall closure that means that time you'll get the largest uh, left ventricular volume that is the end diastolic volume you have to take what is the n systole that is the frame basically following aortic wall closure that means that is the smallest volume lv volume so that is the end systolic volume and then you have to trace the endocardial border you have to exclude the papillary muscle so how to do start either the uh, medial annulus or start as the lateral annulus and draw a straight line and take it towards the um, highest point that is the apical uh, region and this you have to do for both uh, four chamber view and two chamber view this is considered to the lv lane and uh, be because you are going to measure the lv ejection fraction in two of the views that is ideal so this length difference uh, in the two views should not be uh, more than 10% to get a um, ideal uh, lv chamber volume so first you have to zoom and focus the lv cavity second place the marker either lateral annulus or uh, medial annulus to uh, take the points and then trace the entire tissue interfere along with the endocardial border and collect, connect the straight line to take the major axis of the LV. So this is how you will get a uh, volumetric graph. And in so after tracing this, some machine usually uh, give the uh, readings, uh, recordings automatically. And uh, this is in the four chamber view. We can see the um, systolic volume is 33 ml and uh, ventricular end diastolic volume is 64 ml. So ejection fraction is calculated with the formula which I have said um, automatically by the machine that is 48%. That means there is mild LV dysfunction of the patient. Uh, so mostly if you are in hurry, you can see uh, simply eyeballing of the ventricle. You can um, think of uh, what is the ejection fraction. So what are the things you are going to see? The first, uh, you have to see what is the inward motion of the myocardium. So how thickened is the myocardium is there? It, it, if it is thin, that, is, that means there's some kind of dysfunction is there. And what is the longitudinal motion of the mitral annulus? This will go, um, we'll discuss later on also. This is very, very important. If the longitudinal motion of the mitral annulus is less, that means ejection fraction is less. So basically, you have to take two views. One is the short axis view. Um, um, and one is the long axis view, specifically apical uh, four chamber view or the plaques view, as Dr. Amaja said. So, but uh, however, this ejection fraction have some pitfalls, like suppose there is extreme of afterload. So even if uh, you think the ejection fraction is normal patient with a lot of noradrenaline and all, so you get a uh, less ejection fraction, even if the ejection fraction of that patient is normal. In that case, uh, you go for some other method to measure. Similarly, it is influenced by the uh, heart, heart rate. It is basically inversely proportional to the heart rate. Uh, if there is tachycardia, so there is uh, feeling time is less, so that is less ejection, so you get a less uh, ejection volume. So second, that is the um, uh, fractional shortening. What is fractional shortening? That is uh, basically, what is the percentage of reduction of the end diastolic diameter that is occur at the end of systole? This is basically measured in the uh, parasternal long axis view and in the M mode. So what you have to do, you get a good parasternal long axis view and you put the cursor for the M mode at the antramitral tip of the antramitral leaflet and the shortening is calculated like the left ventricular end diastolic diameter minus end ventricular end systolic diameter divided by end, uh, left ventricular end diastolic by, uh, diameter multiplied by 100. If in the ECO report, if it is not, uh, the diagrams are not there and even if it is written uh, like some percentage like this, so you can uh, very well uh, know whether your patient is having impaired ventricular function or normal function. So normally, usually 22 to 43 percent, if it is severely impaired, anything that, that is less than 14 percent. So next is from the, if somebody is going to do only fractional shortening, so from this you can uh, get a rough estimate of ejection fraction also. And if you multiply the value by two, suppose you get a fractional shortening value of 25, so you, you multiply by two, so 50% will be the ejection fraction. But however, this is not applicable if the ventricle is dilated in the mid chamber, and uh, so in that case, LV volume is a better indicator. 
So next is fractional area change. Again, you can go for uh, per external sort axis view and uh, you can measure the trace the area in the diastole and in the systole. From that, you can calculate the uh, um, fractional shortening. That is again, end diastolic area minus end systolic area divided by end diastolic area because it is percentage. So you have to multiply into 100. So normal value is more than 35% and anything less than 15% is uh, having uh, means severe systolic uh, dysfunction. So this is, uh, you can see how the ejection fraction is related with the fractional area shortening. It is almost correlating with the fractional area shortening. So next is uh, stroke volume, cardiac output and uh, cardiac index. Stroke volume, that is the amount of the blood that is ejected by each heartbeat and cardiac output, that is the volume of the blood ejected by the heart per minute. So that means cardiac output is stroke volume uh, multiplied by the heart rate. And the cardiac index is cardiac output per body surface area. So for this, what you have to do, you can go for a parasternal long axis view and measure the LBOT diameter just uh, below the aortic valve uh, insertion. And um, again, in the apical long axis view, you put the cursor uh, in the LBOT and you get a trace like this. And uh, you from this uh, trace, LBOT, VTI can be calculated. And then the machine will automatically calculate your cardiac output. In this case, it is some 3.1 liter per minute. Next is systolic index of contractility. This is basically for the advanced sequel section. And for this, uh, it uh, based on the principle that uh, the maximum rate of rise in left ventricular pressure during the isovolumic contraction stage uh, of the ventricular system that uh, measures a good measure of LV contractility. Suppose there is a ventricular dysfunction that uh, LV pressure buildup will decrease because there is not much contractility. Uh, so the LA pressure will be rise, which will decrease the rate of rise of the MRZ velocity. So for this, I'm not going to go in detail. Uh, basically, you have to get a VTI if MRZ is there and you have to calculate the velocity as a uh, uh, time interval at uh, one second and three second and the, then the machine will automatically calculate or dp by dt and if the number normal number is more than uh, 1200 millimeter mercury per second and uh, severely reduced means it is less than 500 it is severely reduced so myocardial performance index it is again for research interest and if uh, for the advanced eco so this, this is basically how much performance the myocardium has. This can be calculated by the tissue Doppler or in the 2D Doppler. And you have to calculate the isometric uh, contraction time plus isometric uh, relaxation time. And you have to divide that thing uh, with the left ventricular ejection time from which you can get uh, the myocardial performance index. So you can get a trace like that. This is the isovolumic contraction time. This is the relaxation time. And this is the myocardial uh, ejection time. So basically any value less than 0.45 is considered to the normal and above that 0.47 is considered to the abnormal value. And uh, next is tissue Doppler. And for the systolic dysfunction and basically uh, like the annulus movement and in every contraction, the myocardial tissue also moves. So the, from that, the basic concept of tissue Doppler has arrived. So in the TT view, again, you can take uh, the apical four chamber view and uh, you can go for the either the medial annulus or the lateral annulus and put the um, Doppler just uh, beneath the mitral wall on the myocardial tissue. And in this case, you can get three kind of uh, this wave. S is the systolic wave and E prime, A prime, this is the early diastole and this is for the arterial contraction. And uh, for uh, you can measure all the four uh, views like, uh, like uh, uh, anterior, posterior, lateral, and uh, medial. And uh, the septal, the systolic uh, SA in the septal, the normal value is 8.2 plus or minus 1.4. And the average value is 9.8 plus or minus 1.8. And suppose if anything, Below that, it is abnormal. So, what is mitral annular uh, planar systolic uh, excursion? 
So when the heart is contracting, there is a displacement of the mitral annulus plane, as you can see, towards the apex. So this, uh, during each contraction, there is a change in global LV size in the long axis direction. And uh, so there is change in the volume as well. So this is interpreted as volume change during each ejection. So there is close association between this, how much shortening is there? and the ejection fraction both in the normal patient and also in the patient with the left ventricular dysfunction. So any value less than 8 mm, that means ejection fraction is less than 50%. If it is less than 7 mm, that means ejection fraction is less than 30%. So the ideal is it should be more than 10 mm. That means the ejection fraction is preserved. But however, this measurement is only valued if your uh, heart is normal and or if it is dilated. In case of hypertrophic uh, ventricle, this is not valid because uh, some people have hypertrophic ventricle and normal ejection fraction and normal fractional shortening. But however, the MAPC is reduced. It is less than 8 mm or something like that. So you have to remember that it is not valid in the hypertrophic left ventricle. Next, how to measure? You can take apical uh, two-chamber view and apical four-chamber view. Any of the view you can take and you put the MO cursor adherent to the left ventricular wall. So this is how you can get the MO uh, curve and take the lowest point at the end diastole to the, till the aortic uh, wall closure. That is the uh, end of the TUF. You can see corresponding to the TUF in the ECG. So this uh, distance is uh, 2 mm this case. That means this uh, patient is having normal ejection fraction. However, in this case, it is 6 mm. That means this patient have uh, reduced ejection fraction. Next is E-point septal separation, EPSS. This is again very easy to measure. So basically uh, uh, during contraction, what happens? Uh, mitral, uh, uh, tip of the anterior mitral leaflet that uh, stuck into the uh, intraventricular septum. So it is depend upon the force of contraction. More the force of contraction, so it will be uh, attached more to the interventricular septum. So that means the distance would be less uh, for a patient to have normal ventricular function. It is usually seen in the plaques view and the M mode of the mitral valve and IVS should be seen in that view. Any value less than 6 centimeter is normal, 6 mm is normal. And if the patient is low ejection fraction, that means it should be more than 10 mm. So this is how uh, you can put the remote crosser at the tip of the mitral, antimitral uh, annulus. You can see the uh, points about the highest and uh, lowest peak point. And then you can uh, measure that is the E point and the lowest peak point is the A point. So this distance is the your um, E point separation. So that this distance in this case is 0.88 centimeter. That means some ventricular dysfunction is there. So some patient, again, it has some fallacy. Some patient with the normal ventricular function also, you should not go for EPSS even if it is easy. Especially patient with, uh, if they are having mitral stenosis. In this case, there is poor opening of the mitral uh, valve annulus. So there is uh, EPSS is uh, high. So even if the patient is having normal ventricular function because the opening is less, so you get a higher uh, value. Similarly, in the patient with aortic regurgitation, there is poor forward AML in, uh, movement. So again, you will get a falsely high EPSS. Arterial fibrillation, again, there is a, you cannot see the A point due to lack of coordinated arterial contraction. So you can get a bit-to-bit -bit variability in the EPSS. So in this case also, you should not see. Next is regional wall motion abnormality. So I'm not going to into detail. So different LV segments, you can see uh, whether they are akinetic or hypokinetic or dyskinetic or aneurysmal in the, again, the short axis view. For um, each uh, segment have one point each. And like the first segment is, uh, if it is normal, so the ventricle is divided into 17 segment. And for each segment, the... For each value, there is points are distributed. If it is, uh, suppose you get, and the summation of the value is taken to study the regional wall motion abnormality. If your chart is shown, uh, uh, regional wall motion abnormality of one, that means it is normal. So more higher the value, that means more abnormal the patient, and you have to get ready with the inotrop or vasopressor. Next is global longitudinal strain. I'm not going to detail because Dr. Kathir is going to discuss about this. 
So this is basically suppose some uh, system, uh, some substance is deformable. If you can apply a force on that in the system, it move at the different velocity that uh, resulting in deformation. So what basically you measure in this? So this is the ratio of the difference between the final length, whatever length after the deformation, and what was the initial length was there to that of the initial length after application of the force for a time duration. So that means strain is uh, this. And strain rate, this is the rate at which this happens. So that means it is which time it is happened. So as the uh, cardiac system has three set of fibers, that is a longitudinal, circumferential, and uh, radial. So three set of strain is uh, there. And mostly the global strain is taken for the to study the systolic uh, dysfunction, and the value comes uh, as uh, negative. So uh, normal is minus. Uh, it should be more than minus eighteen. If it is borderline, that means minus sixteen to minus eighteen. And in case of LV dysfunction, it is minus sixteen. And uh, so you have to measure from the apical long axis view, and to see the outer wall closure followed by apical four chamber and the two chamber view. So this is how you have to measure. This is the peak strain rate. And in this case, the global systolic strain is minus 16. So that means this case has borderline dysfunction. So now back to the case, the second case, 33 year female, second gravida obese elect for the posted for elective CS. Malampati is grade three. And 12 days before, she has progressive increase in fatigue and dyspnea on exertion on household work. The hemogram was normal, the serum biochemistry was normal, and the echo was sent for the cardiology consultation. The LV was seems to be dilated, the ejection fraction was 60%, and there was a moderate pulmonary hypertension. So the impression was dilated, idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy with severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction. So this patient was treated with digoxin, lasix, and intermittent supplementation uh, 12 days by the cardiologist. And till the day, uh, on the day of LSCS, medication was uh, continued. And serum uh, electrotype was repeated again. It was normal. Coagulation profile was normal. In the OR, respiratory rate was 22 per minute. Blood pressure was 110 by 62. Heart rate was 93 by uh, 92 to 95 per minute with occasional VPC. So we go for additional monitoring CVP and intraatrial pressure. 500 ml of ringer lactate was infused over 15 minutes to increase the CVP from 10 to 15 millimeter mercury and uh, just not to have any uh, intraoperative hypotension and thereby not to precipitate the LV dysfunction further. And the combined spinal epidural was given at the L3, L4 interspace and 6 milligram of hyperbaric bucubacan 0.8 ml uh, of 0.75% plus 15 microfentanyl was injected over 20 seconds into CSF. A weight in the right hip was uh, given to minimize outer cable compression. The upper level of sensory block was obtained T8 at 3 minutes, T6 at 5 minutes and T5 at the 10 minutes. The surgery was uneventful. There is a healthy baby with Apgar score uh, 9 by 10, umbilical cord pH was 7.3. And the uh, CO was supplemented with BPP 5 ml or 0.5% and 0.25% at 60 and 105 minutes respectively. Total volume administered at 1500 ml and TT was done one week. There was improved ejection fraction to 48%. Uh, so this is the first case, 45 year old male, hypertensive, chronic, and plan was resection of the anteromediastinal mass. So he had history of chemo, that means there might be some adhesion. However, the mass was isolated and five to eight centimeter in the anteromediastinum. And uh, ECO shows moderate MR and other walls were normal. Aorta is 21 mm and the MAPSI was 5.5 mm. Septal HTS was 6 mm and lateral was 7.5 mm. That means there is a severe LB dysfunction. LB was uh, dilated and uh, there was global uh, longitudinal strain was minus 13%. You can see a lot of changes in the echo chart. So we went for additional investigation. Coronary angio was normal. Coagulation profile was normal. So additional monitoring was done apart from the normal routine monitoring, CVP, intraatrial blood pressure, uh, NIRS to see any embolization uh, during intra urine output if, uh, because it was a um, uh, post chemo surgery, temperature and uh, blood loss, additional blood was arranged. For the dealing with intraoperative hemodynamic instability, we get ready with the inotrope, vasopressor and the volume. 
Anesthesia drug, uh, you can go for the individual choice, but we went for a, uh, Etos, et cetera, and Dexmed, Fenta, and et cetera, in our case. So the um, perioperative period was uneventful. Post-op, we given multimodal analysis, both oral and intravenous, and the patient was discharged on the um, seventh post-op day. Thank you. Excellent talk, uh, Dr. Minati, uh, madam. And um, thank you for covering all the points in assessing the systolic function in so much detail. And as she has perfectly said that uh, we have our own preferences uh, and we uh, like to do um, a few uh, parameters uh, to assess uh, systolic function. So she has covered everything and uh, we can uh, just pick up any uh, points which we like to uh, use in our assessment. And uh, there she was, she has done an excellent job. And uh, any questions from the faculties? Uh, so let us move on to the- no, no. Wait, 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 one second. One second. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think uh, these guys are still- Are there uh, Dr. Achal, Dr. Hemant? And she has uh, discussed uh, two cases also. Uh, very yeah, well managed, yeah. madam. Uh, very nicely managed cases. Thank you, Dr. Amarjan. Yeah. Like our our uh, reports, the echo reports um, would actually have, like said, lots of uh, information. So if we have to look at, um, you know, which is what are the numbers we are looking at? What what are we going to look for in a systolic uh, dysfunction patient? Okay, like for example, I think you talked about uh, fractional shortening. Very good because. Uh, most of our reports will actually mention uh, fractional shortening, but doesn't now talk about ejection fraction. Very few, I mean, in the last few years, I've seen probably one or two reports which now talk about ejection fraction, uh, but they do talk about like fractional shortening. Yeah. Uh, like you were saying that, okay, in most cases, you can just multiply by two and that is approximately, because whenever I actually talk about any of the uh, you know, echocardiogram reports on that. Everybody wants to know, oh, what is the ejection fraction? Because that's very popular among the Indian, uh, you know, uh, the reports. Everybody actually wants to know the ejection fraction as if that is the main thing. So from your point of view, if you actually, somebody has to look at the uh, systolic dysfunction, uh, what are the things we have to look in an echocardiogram? I'm trying, I might try to find an echocardiogram from our uh, system. Let's say, let's see. I'll... You can, you can uh, continue, sorry. Uh, I would like to add one point, like what we take, uh, if we assess the fractional shortening, uh, we yeah. add 15% uh, to fractional shortening to get ejection fraction. Like Madam said, multiply it by two to get a yeah. fraction uh, fraction. What we do is value of fractional shortening plus 15%, which means okay. if the fractional shortening comes to 25%, add plus 15. So it comes to 40%. Uh, so uh, that is how we uh, interpret uh, ejection fraction from uh, fractional shortening. So where does where this 15% actually come from? Like you adding 15% to... Uh, because the, fractional the shortening is of a, what? Just a it's an arbitrary value which you have actually added to the fractional shortening to get the ejection uh, fraction. No, sir. There are calculations because fractional okay. shortening happens in only one line. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and we and when we take ejection fraction, it is for the global. whole LV. Yeah, it is for yeah. the global LV. So there yeah. are many calculations that go in, and final number we get is uh, fifteen percent, which we have to add in the fractional shortening to get EF. Okay, all right. Any yeah, any so, other parameters we need to yeah, look at? Yeah, Shiv, I think um, the basic of uh, this systolic function is uh, you have three things. I think um, uh, Minati has explained very well. Um, yeah. If I want to add one point, the fractional shortening is nothing but uh, diameter changes yeah. Um, yeah. and if you second better parameter may be fractional area change which is again uh, area um, you know in diastolic minus systolic by diastolic area 
Uh, yes. But ejection fraction is a little bit superior because it, it is supposed to be a volume, in, in diastolic mm -hmm. volume minus in systolic yeah. volume by yeah. end diastolic. So it, it's a diam area is better than diameter. Uh, probably volume is better than um, uh, area. So it, it just gets better as you go up. So mm. better to measure volume, but again, volume measured from uh, extrapolation of your borders. Um, and if you are tracing the borders only in two dimensional echo, it may be less accurate when you compare with three dimensional echo. So if I look at in ascending order uh, yeah. to get better values, number one uh, will be three dimensional ejection yeah. fraction followed by two dimensional ejection fraction uh, if not fractional area change, if we don't get fractional area change, maybe fractional shortening. So that's okay. how I will interpret the reports. Okay, okay. So I think uh, if we are looking at then, we should be actually asking then, why are you not reporting ejection fraction for our patients? Excellent. Yeah, I think um, the if you are telling me that uh, in UK, the technicians report. That's right. Um, but uh, I, I think easiest thing to do is, uh, you know, diameter uh, and report it as a fraction. So if to measure ejection fraction, you have to take, as Minati told, you have to take a four chamber, you have to take a two chamber, and yeah. you have to trace in systole, you have to trace in diastole. It takes yeah. more effort um, mm. to do that. So mm. that the echocardiographer or sonographer has to do a little more work um, to get that accurate calculations and also good views with yes. good endocardial borders. So okay. that may be an issue. <clears throat> yeah, that's very true. Actually, the first uh, sentence in our uh, echocardiogram report will be not able to actually get good views. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's the it's the first statement is always always that. So that's why probably I think they just been like uh, protective, legally protective. Uh, Dr. Achal, yeah. yeah. Yes, Achal. Hi, Shiv. <clears throat> yeah, I totally agree with Kathir. The three D mm. volume is I think one of the best. Yeah. Then comes the two D, and then comes uh, a single. And in that, of yeah. course, area is better than just one dimension. That's true. That's true. I, that's true. If I can share my screen yes you just can. Uh, so this is uh, i think this is the case i did i think last week hmm. this is about the mitral valve uh, uh oh, sorry a repair and yeah. uh, this is how i report my te and this goes hmm. to the patient's electronic chart Yes. So again, general statement about the feasibility, how difficult or how adequate the report or the mm -hmm. findings were. Then mm -hmm. LV was moderately dilated, but normal systolic function, normal RV function, RVSP prolapse, PM with P1, P2 segment prolapse, like that, you know. So mm -hmm. my take home message from the T any report on ejection fraction is, I would like to see whether LV is normal, it is yeah. borderline, it is mm -hmm. moderately uh, dysfunctional or it is severely dysfunction. That mm -hmm. gives me a better idea about uh, planning my patient's management, invasive monitoring lines, and where I dispose of the patient. So ejection fraction is just a number. So if somebody calculates 51, other one calculates 55 or 49, it is mm -hmm. immaterial. Mm -hmm. yeah. What I need to know is if this LV is normal, it is borderline normal, it is moderately dysfunctional, or it is severely dysfunctional. So mm. that is uh, my take on ejection fraction. Yeah, I think what the one other thing which would have been uh, very useful is uh, like patients having valvular disease, which always somebody talking about, and the inter interpretation of the ejection fraction in those cases. Like somebody who's got an aortic regurgitation or mitral regurgitation and ejection fraction, uh, what about in aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis? So in those cases, how do you interpret the, eject, uh, the ejection fraction? That's, that's yeah. a very, very va valid question, Shiv. I think uh, the mm -hmm. most important 
uh, you know consideration is mitral regurgitating lesions yeah uh, if you have uh, let us say the ventricle is normally pumping into the aortic valve uh, mm-hmm. for ejection um, in mitral regurgitation you have two uh, free orifices the left ventricle can pump into uh, one is mitral valve another is aortic valve so uh, if it is freely functioning left ventricle you know so with a no re- no resistance in both sides Mm-hmm. so it will obviously function very very well um, mm-hmm. even if it's not good enough <clears throat> mm-hmm. so if you have an ejection fraction of 65 70% you see in a patient with mitral regurgitation mm-hmm. it is probably around 40 to 45 mm-hmm. it's not mm-hmm. 65 when you eliminate so. that mitral regurgitation component because mm-hmm. it's pumping backwards the mm. uh, anti grade ejection is only you know a fraction of total ejection um so i will say the ejection fraction is uh, over estimated in the presence of mitral regurgitation absolutely uh, number one yeah and number two mitral stenosis if you take um there is no real uh, volume in the left ventricle to pump Mm. um so you you may have left ventricular systolic dysfunction as a part of rheumatic or disease mm. but it may not manifest in the way you measure mm. um, because there is not in much volumes the, again the left ventricle is uh, uh, enjoying the uh, low volume status to pump so once mm. you repair that valve once the um, volume comes into that left ventricle then the left ventricular systolic function become apparent Mm-hmm. um so so again mitral regurgitation and mitral stenosis are very tricky things in terms of um lvef so don't get uh, get fooled by ef measurement exactly exactly i mean that that was the main point uh, what about in patients who have like uh, aortic stenosis say elderly patient come with arteriosclerosis it's very common with age isn't it what about the yeah. yeah so i aortic stenosis has um basically a left ventricular hypertrophy compensating for um your um you know increased resistance beyond at the level of aortic valve so when you measure ef um the left obviously the left ventricle will compensate 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 for a while and then mm-hmm. ultimately gives up um so in the talk i am going to give is more relevant for aortic stenosis because mm-hmm. because as the ventricle hypertrophies um mm-hmm. the diastolic function is the first one to get impaired um then ultimately a systolic function will get impaired so lv ef is the later thing to get impaired um mm. so the left ventricular dysfunction is mostly diastolic to start with and then it become combined systolic and diastolic in um lvh and aortic stenosis mm. i think it's time to move on to the next talk uh, then amarja yes sir uh, <laughs> thank Kateri you himself. uh that was excellent talk from minati mm-hmm. madam and uh, now let us move on to the uh, next talk and uh, diastology or the diastolic dysfunction is as important as systolic function and we have um kathirwal sir uh, for diastology and strain for non cardiac anesthesiologists he is associate professor director perioperative echocardiography education and training and um is professor he's now a... sorry i think we didn't change his uh, oh, thing but he's a professor now yes <laughs> professor at university of pittsburgh uh, work usa <laughs> and his special interests are cardiac anesthesia and transesophageal echocardiography over to you kathir sir thank you amarja thank you um, for having me here shiv and team um this is it is always a pleasure to come to tas um so a couple of disclosures um number one is bala has given me some slides for this talk he has given excellent talks in the past in future i suggest involve him also in this uh, kind of seminars um he is part of this uh, uh, faculty uh, kathir 
Yeah. Oh, he's a busy guy. <laughs> yeah. So, well, so we should. Uh, I'll I'll tell him to join in the next uh, echo meeting. He has a lot of things to say. Um, number two, um, you know, in 2007, um, I hope Archel is listening. I, I went to IACTA and uh, listened to Archel's lecture on uh, diastology. You know, so it's uh, his talk topic was diastology is a myth or reality. So I still remember uh, those peers he told me. Um, you know, things haven't changed much in diastology from 2007 till now. Um, so I will tell you, uh, this lecture is not going to be how to measure diastolic dysfunction, but how to apply, you know, and then how to interpret, uh, how to go in clinical practice for a non-cardiac general practitioner. So uh, first, let us talk about um, what are these the terms uh, number one, you always hear a term diastolic dysfunction. Number two, you always hear a term called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, number three, you hear impaired left ventricular strain. Are they a part of same dysfunction? We are naming it differently. Uh, that has to be answered, first of all. You know, so you may have a normal ejection fraction. Uh, but the impaired left ventricular strain. Um, so is it uh, considered diastolic dysfunction? So that question has never been answered. So we may be terming same thing differently. Uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is another term for diastolic dysfunction. So basically we need to get at some point, come to a consensus, what are we looking at? <clears throat> so that's one thing. Now let's look at uh, one by one. Left ventricular strain, I think um, Minati uh, touched, touched on it. I'll go a little in detail about it because this is going to be a future measurement you will be looking at in the ECHO report. Um, so when you say ejection fraction, it is a measuring the left ventricular dimensions, um, left ventricular cavity dimensions, uh, whether it is systolic and diastolic, what is the change with systole and diastole? And you are interpreting that. But here in myocardial deformation is another term used for myocardial strain imaging. You are looking at the length of the myocardial fibers um, and change in the shape of myocardium. So you change from uh, systole to diastole, what is the length of the myocardium which changes? Uh, what is the change in length of myocardium? That is what we are measuring. It's not the cavity. Um, so if you look at left ventricle, the movements occur in three different directions. One is longitudinally from base to apex. Um, second, circumferentially around. Number three, radially between endocardium and epicardium. So you will have a strain measured at longitudinal strain you also have a circumferential strain, you have a radial strain. Um, but for clinical purpose, for practical purposes, uh, only longitudinal myocardial strain is validated for clinical use. So when somebody says strain, it is always global longitudinal strain right now. It may change in future. So this is a kind of technique in echocardiography they use called speckle tracking echocardiography, which, the, which isolates speckles of myocardium and assesses the change in length of the myocardium with systole and diastole. Um, so it is longitudinal strain, which is basically a measurement of end diastolic and end systolic length difference. Because you are systole, the myocardial length is small and diastole, the length is longer. The measurement is always negative for uh, left ventricle. So when you see left ventricular longitudinal strain in the report, you will see minus 13, minus 14. So you will see that unlike ejection fraction, which will be positive. So here, global longitudinal strain needs three different views to take measurements. So it's not something which can be uh, done with one view. So you need to take into account, um, this is again two-dimensional measurement. This is not three-dimensional measurement. Three-dimensional strain is in development, 
but hasn't come to practice. So looking at it, you need four chamber, you need two chamber, and you need three chamber in trans thoracic views. In trans esophageal, you need four chamber, two chamber, and long axis views. So to measure a global longitudinal strain. <clears throat> so again, it is very automated compared to uh, ejection fraction. All the echocardiography machines are now um, equipped with automatic measurements, whether it is ejection fraction or whether it is uh, strain. So you take these views perfectly. That's what more important. So you take a good views, uh, then you put the patient, you put the measurements on auto mode. It measures auto ejection fraction and auto strain. So that's what the new machines, advanced machines do. Uh, but the echocardiographer has to take good uh, images. If the imaging is not good, all these measurements will be false in auto view. So GLS, why is it important? It is yearly detection of subclinical ventricular dysfunction. I don't know whether it's diastology we are measuring, but again, people say it's a subclinical systolic measurements. It is the yearly part of diastolic dysfunction. There are different views in the literature going. Uh, definitely what is important is it, uh, it, it is deranged earlier than ejection fraction. So you may have a patient with normal ejection fraction, but impaired myocardial function. That is what all these things are uh, trying to find out. So what is the normal value? Um, minus 20 is considered normal. Uh, if you go more towards the negative side, if it is minus 25, minus 30, it's normal value. If it comes towards the positive side, that is abnormal. So if it is minus 10 of left ventricular global strain, that is abnormal. If it is minus 25, it is normal. So that's how you interpret. Um, important consideration is if you use a GE machine, it may give a little more different value compared to Philips machine, compared to Sonocyte. So you need to know the normal values recommended by the vendors. Uh, the uh, societies are trying to come up with a, a common platform for this, um, but it's not out there yet. So if you want to, as I told you, if you want to have a good strain measurements, you need to have good images like the one I have shown, um, nicely traceable endocardial borders you need. If you have uh, bad segments, even if two, three segments are bad, the values are not going to be good. Um, you need to have good EKG tracing so, because it is gated measurement to EKG. So you need to have a good clear P and R waves, fixed R or intervals. Uh, you need to record at least three cardiac cycles. So you, you need to have a good EKG tracing. You can't just in emergency uh, get the imaging, no EKG, the strain will not measure at all. Unlike ejection fraction, you can measure without EKG, but here you cannot. Again, the loading condition does affect strain. It is not load, in, load independent. Uh, that is a problem with anesthesia, isn't it? We change loading conditions too much. So preload increases strain, afterload decreases strain. That limitation still apply like ejection fraction. Um, TEE versus TTE, again different. So most of the studies in, in the literature are conducted using trans thoracic echo. Uh, trans esophageal echo strain is still in development. It is done many studies, but not as much as trans thoracic echo. So when you measure strain, whether you are measuring in the endocardium or myocardium or epicardium, again, that is also important region of interest, but clinically uh, validated measurement is nothing but endocardial strain. Uh, so you always track the endocardium and measure the length of change. So clinical uses, as I told you, um, the normal strain Abnormal strain, normal ejection fraction is something we need to be worried about. Um, especially, uh, this is well validated in cancer patients. If somebody is on breast cancer, uh, taking adriamycin therapy, and uh, they follow up with myocardial strain uh, with transthoracic echo, um, if they find ejection fraction is normal, 
and uh, strain is deranged, they modify the cancer chemotherapy because it is already affecting the myocardium. So it's the future is all about finding out yeah, very early what is the myocardial dysfunction. Whether it is perioperatively useful or not, we are trying to find our uses, but I will say currently uh, there is no, no documented use of um, myocardial strain in the perioperative period. Uh, there are two studies from our institution published using three-dimensional strain. Um, if you uh, find out from preoperative transthoracic echo a deranged myocardial strain compared to patients without deranged myocardial strain, the outcome is affected like a 30-day mortality, one-year mortality, or worse when you have uh, abnormal strain and normal ejection fraction. Uh, that has been shown in current some clinical studies. So clinical uses, um, I will say if you find a patient with cabbage um, coming to the operating room or aortic valve uh, or mitral valve disease, they may have a normal ejection fraction, but they will have an abnormal strain. Um, is the outcome in these patients different from somebody who has normal EF, normal strain that is yet to be established and yet to be studied well and the societies don't have a recommendation for a perioperative period, uh, even in non-cardiac surgery. There is some literature on strain and non-cardiac surgery, but it's not well proven. So for practical purposes, to conclude, um, you will see this strain measurement more and more in your reports. And to see, to interpret the value, you should know minus 20 is a kind of normal value. Anything moving towards negative, um, you're okay. If it, you're seeing a value less than minus 20, uh, then you may consider there could be some myocardial dysfunction and take precautions. That is all we can say at this point. So going to the um, typical diastology. Um, so we, um, the cardiac physiology actually described very, very uh, in detail. Um, I'll tell you, so compared to systole and diastole, this is a very, very uh, intricate interaction between calcium, actin, myosin filaments, and tropomyosin. So as you see, in diastole, the uh, myosin binding sites are covered by the stropomyosin because of active process. This is, again, you should know the diastole is an active energy spending process. Just because it is relaxing, it doesn't mean it is happening passively. That's the most important. Since it is an active energy spending process, if you have an ischemia of the myocardium or any strain on the myocardium, it will affect the diastolic dysfunction very, very early. So finding out a diastolic dysfunction may be important because it happens very, very early. Uh, and then there are four phases of diastole, that is IVRT, early filling, diastasis, and late filling. So if the aortic valve is closed after ejection, till the mitral valve opens, um, that is called IVRT, intraventricular relaxation time, isovolemic relaxation time. Um, there is no real assessment of diastolic dysfunction or diastolic measure uh, during this phase. That is the problem. So every diastolic dysfunction measurement comes out after the mitral valve opens. During this phase, everything, all the measurements comes out. There is no real measurement of IVRT. So that could be a problem. So most of the diastolic dysfunctions evaluate later phase of diastole. Um, early diastolic filling, that is the main active filling phase. There is active relaxation of the left ventricle and the pressure in the left ventricle drops and the left atrial pressure is higher. Uh, compared to left ventricular pressure. So there is filling in the left ventricle. And then over the time, pressure equalizes between left atrium and left ventricle. Um, then there is an active diastasis phase uh, where there is a minimal filling happens. And then there will be atrial contraction phase where the atri left atrial pressure goes up 
compared to left ventricular pressure, then there is more filling happens. So if you quantitate 80% of filling happens during early filling phase, 5% of left ventricular ha filling happens during diastasis, and 15% happens during atrial systole that may differ in pathologic conditions. So that's about um, four different phases of diastole. Now, for practical purposes, as I told you, early diastolic filling needs energy. Late diastole depends on compliance of the left, how much compliant the left ventricle is. So when you say diastolic dysfunction, early diastolic dysfunction evaluates the uh, early diastolic filling, late diastolic dysfunction or advanced diastolic fiction evaluates decreased compliance. So those are all the two things. If you have poor compliance, that is almost like an advanced diastolic dysfunction. So in the community uh, level, uh, diastolic dysfunction is very well known. That's the difference between cardiology echo reports and anesthesia intraoperative or postoperative reports. Um, it is in community settings, what do they do? Um, so they have a patient who is spontaneously breathing, um, who has um, normal or um, overloaded ventricles. Um, you have a patient in left lateral position and you are using transthoracic echo. So what do you do in anesthesia? You have different loading conditions. Uh, you are using transesophageal echo. You have a patient on positive pressure ventilation. So the measures what they give in the pre-operative transthoracic report may be different when you do in intraoperative period. So and anything you do fresh in the intraoperative period may not be really, really validated for use clinically. So what you want to do is you want to look at the pre-operative report and then see whether there is a diastolic dysfunction or not and plan accordingly, rather than trying to diagnose diastolic dysfunction intraoperatively when the loading conditions change a lot. So you need to have, a, again, clinical suspicion. So if you have a patient with uh, coronary artery disease, if you have a patient with a chronic hypertension with the left ventricular hypertrophy or hypertensive heart disease, or if you have a patient already have a systolic dysfunction, or a patient having complaints of dyspnea on exertion, you should suspect the patient also have diastolic dysfunction. So this is what the clinical suspicion is important. So when a patient has depressed systolic function, it is given the patient also have depressed diastolic function. But if a patient has normal systolic function, you may or may not have depressed diastolic function. So this is the uh, society's data. So if you look at heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, as I told you, um, the integral part of that diagnosis, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is diastolic dysfunction. You see the third criteria is left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. Again, you have uh, European Society of Cardiology also have evidence of diastolic dysfunction. So it can be a, a different name, but it all implies quite similar things like heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and diastolic dysfunction. So what is important perioperative period? This is a study from Bala's group in vascular surgical patients. Uh, they have shown that uh, you have a patient with diastolic dysfunction, um, then the outcome is definitely affected um, as uh, age, type of surgery, female's gender, renal failure, diastolic dysfunction is also important in determining the patient outcomes. Um, what did this study show? You, you, they divided the patient into normal um, function, isolated systolic dysfunction, isolated diastolic dysfunction, combined uh, systolic and diastolic dysfunction. So <clears throat> the um, adverse outcomes happen in 24%, um, sorry, 32% in patients with combined and systolic and diastolic dysfunction, 
38% in isolated diastolic dysfunction, 8% in systolic dysfunction. Part of the problem is if you know the patient has low ejection fraction, you manage the patient precautions very well. So that could be a reason for uh, patients with low EF doing well. Um, but if you, you may not know the patient has a diastolic dysfunction or a combined diastolic systolic dysfunction. So you are a little bit, little bit liberal in managing those patients, then the outcome will be. So that's the importance. You should know whether there is a diastolic dysfunction or not. So clearly the study has shown uh, compared to a normal and isolated systolic dysfunction, if you have isolated diastolic or combined dysfunction, the outcomes are affected like congestive heart failure and other uh, composite outcomes. And this is a multivariable analysis, which already which all, also shown diastolic dysfunction measured by VP, propagation velocity. I don't need to go into detail, um, but it, it affects the patient outcomes. Like patient is having congestive failure or arrhythmia, or weaning problems, those are all more if you have diastolic dysfunction. So this is again a systematic review of studies which were evaluating a diastolic dysfunction and non-cardiac surgery to outcomes. Um, and this study also have shown almost like five, six studies put together, they also shown the outcome difference. Um, then it, if you look at congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema post-operative, um, it's more in patients who have it's more in patients who have diastolic dysfunction. Higher odds with uh, PDD, that means diastolic dysfunction. It is more towards the um, diastolic dysfunction. That means more side effects in patients with diastolic dysfunction. Um, again, in patient myocardial infarction is again deviated towards diastolic dysfunction. More patients with the diastolic dysfunction will develop post-op myocardial infarction. Uh, more patients with diastolic dysfunction will develop pulmonary edema. So there is always skepticism. So there is always denial. There is always rationalization. I don't know um, how to interpret. I don't know how to assess it. Who cares? It's too complicated. So these things should not come in the way in diastolic dysfunctions. Another problem which I explained to you in that study is if you have isolated systolic dysfunction compared to deranged systolic and diastolic dysfunction, uh, there may be different symptoms, there may be different course. If you let us take one patient has an EF of 30% and he has grade one diastolic dysfunction. The other patient has the same ejection fraction, like 35%, but he has grade three diastolic dysfunction. So that patient with grade three diastolic dysfunction will do poorly compared to grade one diastolic dysfunction in spite of having the same ejection fraction. So how do you measure that? Now we know the diastolic function is important to know. So now we should know how to measure it. Um, the ideally what do you want to do is put a catheter in the left ventricle and measure the rate of systolic pressure decay. Uh, faster the decay indicates normal function. That means the ventricles are relaxing normally. If there is a slower decay, that means the left ventricle is not relaxing normally. So, uh, but how much, you, how many patients you can put a catheter in LV, probably in the experimental lab. So that is why we use echocardiography as a surrogate measure of diastolic dysfunction. So what are the echocardiographic measurements? You need to use advanced technology to measure diastolic dysfunction, unlike systolic dysfunction. Systolic dysfunction, you can eyeball, you can measure fractional shortening, you can measure fractional area change or EF, um, that is very common, but for diastology, you need to know pulse wave Doppler, you need to know continuous wave Doppler, you need to know tissue Doppler, you need to know how to measure left atrial volume index. So this is not for a general practitioner. This is something which has to come out of advanced echocardiography laboratory or cardiac anesthesiology or somebody. So I'm not going to teach in detail how to measure, how to get the measurements. 
So that is for somebody who has done that for years. This is not for a basic echocardiographer. This has to be done by advanced transthoracic echocardiographers. For every echo parameter, you should know how do we measure, but what are the caveats? So all these measurements, as I told you, are afterload dependent, preload dependent. So you should know how to interpret those things. Uh, now I told you, so there are two measurements. You can measure the velocity of blood flow through the mitral valve. That is the blood flow velocity. Number two is you can measure the velocity in the myocardial tissue in the mitral valve annulus. So the tissue annulus measurement is called the myocardial tissue velocity that is E dash and A dash, but the blood flow velocities are called E and A. So that is what you will see in the report. If you see E and A, the, what they are measuring is a blood flow velocity through the mitral valve. But if they mention E dash and A dash, that means they are measuring the velocity at the annulus or myocardial tissue. So obviously when you measure from myocardial tissue, it should be better than what we measure in the blood, which may be depending on the volume changes. Uh, so it is blood flow measurements or flow dependent, heart rate dependent, Myocardial measurements, again, it is one third, tenth of the velocity of the blood flow. It can be flow and heart rate independent, but there are other things which can happen if you have calcium in the mitral annulus, or if you have infarcted tissue which scarred um, uh, over years in the myocardial tissue, then you are not pro providing a good measurement. So there are caveats, whether you measure through blood flow or in the tissue. So this is through the blood flow. As you, saw, as you see, there is a line of Doppler through the mitral valve and it is measuring the blood flow velocity. And what you see is the, uh, the diastole. The, when you see the EKG, this is the QRS complex and this is the T wave. So the one which follows T wave is diastole before QRS complex. So this is the diastolic phase. And you see E waveform is the early diastolic filling. A waveform is the atrial systole. So E waveform, early diastolic filling is the most important measure because that is the most important diastolic phase. So the configuration of E waveform to A waveform is used to diagnose diastolic dysfunction. So what, what is E wave, as I told you, the early diastolic filling is most of the 80%. So the E wave is normally higher than the A wave. The amplitude of E wave is higher than the A wave normally. So that's one thing you need to know. Again, the, um, if you infuse volume into your patient and measure the same E A wave form, it will look different. If you have a blood loss in the patient and measure E and A wave form, that will show a different value. Um, so also if you ask the patient to take a Valsalva maneuver, then also it will change. So look at this patient is having a Valsalva maneuver. E, here it is E is bigger than A, but in this after Valsalva, E has become smaller than A. It's extremely load dependent uh, measurements. Um, now coming to the tissue Doppler. So this is what you are measuring at the mitral valve annulus either in the septum or in the lateral wall. Now, it also has E and A waveforms, which measures the early diastole and the atrial systole, but it is the velocities are almost one-tenth of the blood flow velocities, and it is less, of, less impacted by the heart rate, flows, and other things. Now, the, as I told you, the problem with tissue myocardial measurements are you may have annular calcification, you may have valvular heart disease, uh, you may have constrictive pericarditis, all this can affect tissue dopplers. It is not completely uh, false proof. Uh, so <clears throat> now I told you the uh, measurements you take from tissues should be combined with the blood flow velocities to come out with a conclusion. Um, so these are all the measurements will, they will take 
uh, they take the measurements of blood flow velocities and divide by the tissue velocities. That is called E by E dash. Um, that is supposed to indicate the left atrial pressure. Um, so the, when you compare the myocardial tissue velocities to the blood flow velocities, you are measuring the proximal chamber pressure. Uh, that is the left atrial pressure, which is pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So people have compared these measurements to the catheter measured pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. E to E dash ratio can be used as a preload for left ventricle, which is a left atrial pressure. So if it is more than 15, the left atrial pressure is elevated. If it is less than 15, left atrial pressure may be normal. So that's one interpretation you may want to know in the report. People report E by E dash, which is 13. What does that mean? The left atrial pressure is not elevated. That's what it means, which is actually the measuring the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Um, but there are studies correlating these two. Some studies have shown poor correlation. Some studies have shown good correlation. Now, the diastology, like systology, will also affect the other chambers it can produce back pressure uh, like pulmonary capillaries. That is why the patients develop pulmonary edema. If you look at pulmonary edema, 100 patients developing pulmonary edema, 50% of them don't have low ejection fraction. 50% of them have only diastolic dysfunction. So that is because your back pressure builds up from elevated left atrial pressure into pulmonary capillaries and the fluid leaks out of the pulmonary capillaries into the uh, lungs causing pulmonary edema. Then if the isolated ventricular diastolic function is longer, longer, then it may affect the right ventricle. It may affect the tricuspid valve. As Achal mentioned, you can measure the uh, tricuspid valve velocities and measure the PA pressures. That will be elevated at some point with diastolic dysfunction. All these things are combined together to come up with the diastolic dysfunction present or not. So in your echo report, you will see all these things. You will see E velocities, A velocities. You will see E by E dash. You will see tricuspid regurgitation velocity. You will also see left atrial volume index. The left atrial volume, you can measure only through transthoracic echo, not by transesophageal echo. So this is a, a exclusively transthoracic echo measurements. All these things should be combined to interpret whether the patient has diastolic dysfunction or not. Now, how to grade the diastolic dysfunction? That is simply whether you have the E to E, you have three measurements. One is E to E dash ratio. Uh, you have TR velocities. You have left atrial volume index. If all three are abnormal, that patient has an advanced diastolic dysfunction. If two or three are negative, three are negative, then the patient has early diastolic dysfunction. Uh, if it is equivocal, it is somewhere grade two diastolic dysfunction. So you need to know what is E to E dash ratio. You need to know what is T or velocity. You need to know what is the left atrial volume. If all three are abnormal or two of three are abnormal, you have advanced diastolic dysfunction or grade three diastolic dysfunction. If all the three are normal, all two out of three are normal, then the patient has grade one or um, early diastolic dysfunction. If you are equivocal, um, then you have intermittent or grade two diastolic dysfunction. That's how you measure. Now, having known, now you know the diastolic, diastology is important. Number two, you know how to interpret the report uh, of diastology. Now, how to manage these patients? Uh, look at this. This is the systolic dysfunction, heart failure with uh, heart failure with uh, deranged ejection fraction, like low ejection fraction. You can treat with several means. 
if you have a patient with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or diastolic dysfunction none of these drugs work like beta blocker angiotensin inhibitor digitalis pde5 inhibitor like sildenafil or milrinone nitrates none of these drugs work for diastolic dysfunction none of this has been proven to be effective for diastolic dysfunction so you will know there is diastolic dysfunction but the treatment is very minimal if you are overloaded or pulmonary edema you can treat with diuretics but there is no other drug which is magic for diastolic dysfunction statins are questionable whether they work for diastolic dysfunction or not what works is control the diabetes control the hypertension control the coronary artery disease lose the weight uh, put the patient on cardiopulmonary rehabilitation so all these things work for diastolic dysfunction so in short treat the cause that's what works for diastology so you don't have that leverage when the patient presents for you in anesthesia you can't treat the diabetes you can't completely cure the diabetes during that period so you can only damage control under anesthesia for diastolic dysfunction you cannot completely treat them people say start on iv milrinone infusion uh, people say um, decrease the blood pressure to enhance emptying of the ventricle i will go through it is it useful or not not proven strategy in this cases um, <clears throat> so as i told you for clinical purposes you have early diastolic dysfunction and advanced diastolic dysfunction advanced diastolic dysfunction is reduced compliance of the left ventricle uh, early diastolic dysfunction is impaired filling of the left ventricles so these two should be clinically should be distinguished um the why the management differs under anesthesia uh, so if you go through i will go back to one of the slides so as i told you this is the early diastolic dysfunction you have e wave bigger than a wave that means ea ratio is not that much deranged um, <clears throat> so it is ra ratio around 1 to 1.2 that is a early diastolic dysfunction or filling diastolic dysfunction in this case the a wave is still prominent that means the atrial function is still prominent Uh, uh, is important in diastolic filling so maintaining a sinus rhythm is very important for early diastolic dysfunction if you have a report which says grade 1 diastolic dysfunction maintaining a sinus rhythm is very very important because atrial a wave is still prominent in those patients now going to the second point preload tolerance what that means is your ventricle compliance is still still not too bad that means if you give fluids the patient will not go into pulmonary edema if you have early diastolic dysfunction um in contrary if you have a patient with the advanced diastolic dysfunction you have to be very very careful in giving fluids if you give Uh, a judicious uh, if you give uh, uh, fluids inadvertently open the fluid and did not close it the one liter of fluids gone in the patient may go into pulmonary edema if you have reduced compliance problem so it is preload intolerant in advanced diastolic dysfunction as you see the a wave is very minimum in reduced compliance compared to um early diastolic dysfunction so the sinus rhythm maintenance may not be that that important may not contribute that much um in advanced diastolic dysfunction uh, number 2 um is time dependent filling in early so still the in early diastolic filling the timing of diastole is very very important um so that means if you produce tachycardia uh, the ventricle filling early diastolic filling will be impaired to a greater degree and you are going to have hypotension so if you have a grade 1 diastolic dysfunction maintain sinus rhythm 
you can give fluids if the patient develops hypotension and you have to avoid tachycardia for those patients. But in advanced grade three diastolic dysfunction, um, if you give too much fluids, the patient is going to go to pulmonary edema. You have fixed stroke volume. Uh, your sinus rhythm uh, is less important, though it, it is important, but it's not as crucial as early diastolic dysfunction because you have fixed stroke volume. It is heart rate dependent. So the, if you have um, uh, the, since the stroke volume is fixed, only way you can increase the cardiac output is maintaining a heart rate around 80 to 90. Um, you, you cannot have heart rate of 50 and 60. So beta blocking intraoperatively may not help a patient with advanced diastolic dysfunction. Again, the afterload is very important in maintaining blood pressure and coronary perfusion in patients with advanced diastolic dysfunction. So knowing the grade of diastolic dysfunction is important in planning anesthetic management. So careful fluid management, use of inotropes, not really useful in diastolic dysfunction. Some people used nesitride that may be useful in patients with fluid overload. Um, it is important to monitor these patients postoperatively in ICU settings if you have grade three diastolic dysfunction and an advanced uh, major surgical procedure. Um, you, you may have experimental drugs coming in like actin, myosin, bridge interfering drugs, but again, not proven. Uh, tachycardia, a big no-no in early diastolic dysfunction. Um, you want to allow for complete filling. That's why tachycardia is uh, not very good in early diastolic dysfunction. Uh, there is some evidence to show um, Inhalation agents may be beneficial in LV filling compared to intravenous agents. Uh, maintaining sinus rhythm, I talked to you about. So take home messages. Um, I will say number one, there are things still evolving in this whole uh, diastolic dysfunction. Uh, even though we know this for years and years, um, we are still exploring in the perioperative period. Number two, um, the there is no doubt the patients with diastolic dysfunction compared to normal function will have deranged outcomes perioperatively that we know. And you know how to measure and how to interpret uh, the diastolic dysfunction perioperatively in the preoperative report. You should know how to interpret whether there is a diastolic dysfunction present or not. Number two, to what is the grade of diastolic dysfunction? Um, once you know that information, what you can do is very, very limited. If you have a, a early diastolic dysfunction, maintain sinus rhythm, give fluids, um, and then allow, um, don't allow tachycardia. If you have advanced diastolic dysfunction, um, you have fixed stroke volume, so maintaining a good blood pressure or good afterload using norepinephrine may be helpful. Um, yet heart rate of 60 to 80 rather than 60 and below is better um, in these patients. Very, very careful about fluids because if you give uh, minimum fluids to an impaired compliance patient, they may develop pulmonary edema. Sinus rhythm is so important in early diastolic dysfunction, not so crucial, though important in late diastolic dysfunction. I am hoping that helps to understand diastology and we can start the discussion. Excellent talk, uh, Kathirwal, sir. And uh, you can stop thank sharing. you from all of us. Uh, yes, the uh, forum is open for discussion. Sir, if I may. Kathir, can you stop sharing your screen, please? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. There, no, no, no problem. Yes, Guru Santia, you, you may yes, ask. Sir, uh, we've actually had one patient with a grade 3 diastolic dysfunction who actually went in for a pulmonary edema in a lithotomy position. 
so that amount of volume overload also those patients don't tolerate well mm -hmm. so we just took up the lithotomy gave hemorrhoidectomy you... but it was for a hemorrhoidectomy so even that lithotomy or uh, tourniquet for bilateral limbs those patients may not tolerate well yes. so we have to be careful in such patients giving lithotomy we have to anticipate prior before giving lithotomy what was the diagnosis in this patient grade 3 diastolic dysfunction with now uh, with the ejection fraction of 40% ma'am okay, okay we gave a low dose spinal and then uh, went in for the procedure but then he did not went in for pulmonary edema so do you, do you think that because you actually had a patient who he gave spinal which will cause vasodilation the fluid goes into the lower limbs and then you put them a lithotomy position the fluid goes do you think ga would have been better at the time when he developed pulmonary edema i thought i should have given ga <laughs> <laughs> the treatment is always a tube and oxygen <laughs> yes sir so it then, is all we all we always think like to mitigate uh, yeah we, at, at times we always think spinal is safer or uh, you do not instrument the airway but then ultimately yeah. we land up in giving a tube for the, i did land up in giving a tube we, for the patient yeah plan b c d is always a tube and uh, <laughs> you know giving oxygen uh, kathir you didn't actually mention about volatile anesthetics may be better for diastolic dysfunction is it because they are all calcium channel blockers as well and cause relaxation yeah or... so th there is a, a lot of uh, studies on that with the ischemic preconditioning too if you have yes uh, that's you know, right yes. so so there is i i won't put a lot of money on that but there is there is some evidence to say that maybe a patient with diastology you should not you know maybe preferably give sevoflurane anesthesia than uh, a propofol anesthetic um so you know again propofol may decrease the blood pressure there are other variables which may be involved um yeah. but i will say if you see in the report grade 3 diastolic dysfunction go with sevoflurane than uh, you know 200 mics of propofol yeah yeah no i think uh, the uh, what guru santhya has actually just mentioned is actually very important thing Uh, where you actually have diastolic dysfunction, and you're going to give us something a uh, regional like epidural spinal, where you're going to have vasodilation in the lower limbs. Fluid moves there, and then they change the position, and then fluid get back into the circulation, and patient goes to pulmonary. So I think uh, that's a quite a learning point actually there, which we may yeah. ignore. Yeah. Yeah. One of the um, I think I still remember last time when I. Uh, Uh, was in zoom with you guys for mm. uh, physiology talk one of the question one of the case report from someone from madras uh, posted a case of um, obstetric patient uh, came for anesthesia um, normal normal lady um, with some history of hypertension pre operatively pregnancy induced hypertension and the patient was given spinal epidural um, then the patient basically went into florid pulmonary edema mm -hmm. um so that 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 is ultimately the diagnosis was uh, hypertensive episodes leading to diastolic dysfunction uh, mm -hmm. causing pulmonary edema because the patient's ef was 55 to 60% mm -hmm. so it can happen uh, it can basically surprise you in the clinical period um, mm -hmm. so when you have an unanticipated pulmonary edema always suspect uh, there is a diastolic problem i think you can uh, rapidly prop up the position uh, prop up the patient so really it would help <laughs> you know straight <laughs> but head up completely blood in them yeah you know you know you know i think that uh, has a point he was yeah, yeah. go ahead Can can I, can I make a, a, yeah yeah doctor yeah uh, thank you dr kathir it was a wonderful uh, talk and you made the uh, diastology very simple the usually this because as i understand this talk is directed towards the general physician general anesthetist so if they see the report 
uh, of uh, echocardiography because they, they they are not going to do themselves if they find that uh, you have a grade 1 patient has a grade 1 diastolic dysfunction and if you end up in the hypotension you can just make a straight leg raising test hmm. if you raise the leg and if the pressure improves that means patient needs a volume yeah. However, if grade 2 or 3 diastolic dysfunction, it is better to start uh, inotrop right from the beginning than yeah. uh, waiting for the hypotension to occur. So this is the message, uh, I think, uh, which is very important in such patients. But excellent talk. You made diastology very simple, actually. Excellent thank talk. You. Thank you. I think, yeah, that's, that's really, really the uh, take-home point. Um, the difference on management is so important between early and late diastology. <clears throat> Dr. Achal. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah excellent. Dr. Talk. Achal, the, the yes. Dr. Achal's talk in uh, 2007 uh, yeah. hasn't changed much. I still remember your uh, peers from your talk. You remember or not, I do remember. <laughs> of course, yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. that is the situation. And if I was given a case of severe systolic dysfunction, I'd be very happy to manage that compared to a case of very severe diastolic dysfunction. Mm -hmm. As you rightly pointed out, there is hardly anything we can do. We actually did a couple of liver transplants with stage three, like the restrictive pattern of diastolic dysfunction. And I was just crossing my fingers and praying all the time. Uh, just one, one uh, comment regarding the diastology of uh, E and A. Normally, yes, A wave does not matter in normal hearts, in young, healthy people. And if they flip into atrial fibrillation, they drop their cardiac output only about 10, 15%, not much. So they are asymptomatic usually. Same situation happening in a, say, an 80-year-old female with, say, uh, normal to, sorry, grade one to grade two diastolic dysfunction, now they are dependent on their atrial kick. Uh, their filling happens during the atrial systole, that is the A wave, and they contribute maybe up to 25, 30% of the cardiac output. And this lady flips into atrial fibrillation, she will faint, she will have pre-syncope. So just to giving the importance of uh, uh, the filling of the left ventricle, depending upon uh, what stage of diastolic dysfunction they have. But excellent talk, I really enjoyed. Shall we move on uh, then, Amarjit? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, that was excellent talk and uh, thanks to Catherwell, sir. And uh, moving on uh, to the last lecture of this session today, uh, it will be valvular heart disease uh, in a uh, patient for non-cardiac surgery. And uh, this talk will be presented by Dr. Guru Santhia under the guidance of Dr. Nima. Dr. Nima is professor in anesthesiology, Ames Raipur, Chhattisgarh, and his main interests are in valvular heart disease, blood conservation in cardiac surgery, and anesthesia for vascular surgery. And Dr. Guru Santhia is consultant anesthesiologist at Kumaran Medical College, Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu. And her special interests are cardiac anesthesia, obstetric, and pediatric anesthesia. Over to you, Dr. Guru Santhia. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, Shiv, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. Today, I will be discussing about patients who have got valvular heart disease and those who are coming for non cardiac surgery. Pictures are taken from the internet, obviously. And today, we will be discussing about the valvular heart disease. There are left-sided valves and right-sided valves. The left-sided valves are the aortic valve and the mitral valve. And the right-sided valves are tricuspid valve and the pulmonary valve. Each of these valves have got a stenotic lesion or a regurgitant lesion. We will be discussing about all these eight permutation and combinations now. In this discussion, we will see about the causes of valvular heart disease, the echo criteria. Based on the echo criteria, how critical is the patient how are you going to prepare yourself in the perioperative period? What is the cardiac grid you would follow for specific valvular heart disease? And how do you deal with the perioperative emergencies? So the first valve I would address is the aortic valve. The normal aortic valve area is three to four centimeters square. 
In aortic stenosis, the causes can be bicuspid aortic valve or a calcified aortic valve. In developing nations like India, the rheumatic heart disease is the most common cause. Normally, the aortic valve is tricuspid. As Amaja has, ma'am has mentioned, it has a right coronary cusp, left coronary cusp, and a non-coronary cusp. In case of a bicuspid aortic valve, it has got only two cusps, which is essentially right and the left. In the normal aortic valve opening, the valve opens like this kind of so. In this part of the picture, it opens more like a dooming, leading to aortic stenosis. Coming on to the echo criteria for diagnosing the aortic stenosis, primarily when you get an echo report, all these parameters will be there when the patient has got an aortic stenosis per se. Say the aortic valve peak velocity, the mean pressure gradient across the aortic valve, the aortic valve area in centimeter square and the velocity ratio. If it is an aortic sclerosis, the peak velocity is essentially less than 2.6 meters per second. But in a severe aortic stenosis, it is more than four and the mean gradient is essentially more than 40. In AHA grading, it is very severe if it is more than 60 millimeters of mercury. When the aortic valve area is more than 1.5, it is mild. 1 to 1.5 is moderate and less than one is severe. And the velocity ratio of less than 0.25 is considered as severe aortic stenosis. So whenever you get an echo report saying that the valve area is less than one, then and the pressure gradient is somewhere around 50 to 60, then you have to be very careful because the patient is having a severe aortic stenosis. These patients usually, as uh, Kadir sir has mentioned, these patients usually try with concentric hypertrophy and match for normal LV systolic function. But eventually, whenever the LV decompensates, they will go for the ejection fraction will fail and they will, they will also have heart failure with preserved, I mean, reduced ejection fraction. So this is a transesophageal image showing the normal aortic valve opening. And here, as you can see, the aortic valve kinds of stenosed and it's opening is not as proper as shown in this figure. And you can also see there is a concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. This is another echo image showing, showing the echo parameter. There, this is an apical five chamber view and there's a continuous wave Doppler which is put across the aortic valve. And this is the wave which we have obtained. And here we can see the mean pressure gradient is 52, which is more than 40. So this patient has got a severe aortic valve sclerosis. And here the aortic valve area is measured by planimetry. It can also be measured by a continuity equation. The valve area is 0.5. It means the patient has got a severe aortic stenosis. Any patient may be stenotic lesion or a regurgitant lesion. There is no magic drug from preventing the valve to be stenosed or valve to be having a regurgitant lesion. All we can do is control the comorbid illness and the untoward effects which would occur because of the stenotic or regurgitant lesion. If the patient of AS has got a hypertension, we do not normally treat if the patient has got a systolic blood pressure of around 140 or 160. If it is still higher, you can try and bring down the blood pressure, but you always take tend to keep the blood pressure higher for such patients. You can actually start them on AC inhibitors. Diuretics a big no because it cannot uh, decrease the stroke volume and then thereby decreasing the cardiac output in such patients, precipitating a uh, failure. You can start them on statins. There are a few studies saying statins are helpful. And we also have to remember that these patients, because of the concentric LVH, they may have demand supply mismatch and a concomitant coronary artery disease as well. And that has to be addressed. The next valve lesion I will be talking about is the aortic regurgitation. It can be an acute aortic regurgitation or a chronic aortic regurgitation. Acute aortic regurgitation can be because of aortic dissection or infective endocarditis or trauma. Chronic aortic regurgitation can be because of senile leaflet calcification, a bicuspid aortic valve, infective endocarditis, and in developing countries, rheumatic heart disease. And annulo aortic ectasias may include Marfan's disease, aortic dissection, syphilis, or any collagen vascular disease, Ehlers Down loss, etc. Any regurgitant lesion, if you see an echocardiography report, you always look for what is the vena contracta width. The vena contracta is the narrowest part of the regurgitant jet. And you look for what is the effective regurgitant orifice area. What is the regurgitant volume? What is the regurgitant percentage? 
and in a regurgitation you also look for the diastolic flow reversal either in case of aortic uh, regurgitation you look for diastolic flow reversal in the descending aorta in tricuspid regurgitation you look for it in the ivc so in case of aortic regurgitation what you will look for is the vena contracta width which is the narrowest part of the ar jet if it is less than 3 mm then it is mild when it is more than 6 mm it is severe when the effective regurgitated orifice area if it is less than 10 mm square it is mild when it is 10 to 19 it is mild to moderate when it is 20 to 29 it is moderate to severe and when it is more than 30 it is severe aortic regurgitation when the regurgitant volume is less than 30 ml then it is mild when it is 30 to 44 then it is a mild to moderate ar when it is 45 to 59 it is a moderate to severe ar when there is more than 60 it is a severe ar and one more parameter to look for is the diastolic flow reversal when there is a hollow diastolic flow reversal in the descending aorta then it means the patient has got a severe ar in the case of ar we also have to look for if the aortic root is dilated as well to exclude the aortic root as a cause of aortic regurgitation you actually have to measure at the level of lvot at the level of aortic annulus sinus of valsalva sinotubular junction and the ascending aorta here we can see in the color doppler that the blood regurgitates towards the lv when the aortic valve is closing signifying that it is a aortic regurgitation coming to the management of ar if it's an acute ar then the emergency intervention is the only treatment of choice in case of chronic ar if the patient is hypertensive you treat the hypertension only when it is more than 140 mm of mercury in case if the patient is severely symptomatic in ar then you can start them on ac inhibitors or arbs or sacubitril or valsartan sacubitril is a neprilysin interceptor inhibitor coming on to the next valve which is a mitral valve this is a left sided valve as you can see this is named mitral because it resembles the bishop's mitre it has got two leaflets the anterior mitral leaflet and the posterior mitral leaflet this is the uh, echo image of classical mitral stenosis showing the hockey sticking of the anterior mitral leaflet coming on to the causes of mitral stenosis it can again be calcific degenerative and rheumatic etiology which is common in uh, our part of the world and uh, this image is uh, taken from miller in standard textbooks like miller they have given the criteria based on 2005 circulation guidelines wherein the mild is more than 1.8 moderate is 1.2 to 1.6 and moderate to severe is 1 to 1.2 and severe is less than 1 there are also people who like advise to say when the valve area is less than 0.5 cm square then it is a critical stenosis but in aha 2014 and 17 guidelines updated guidelines when the valve area is less than 1.5 then it becomes a severe stenosis when the valve area is less than 1 it becomes a very severe stenosis this is a mean gradient across the mitral valve when it is 2 to 4 it is mild when there is 4 to 9 it is moderate when it is more than 15 it is severe mitral stenosis per se can be accompanied by because the right ventricle takes the brunt in the mitral valve disease it will be usually associated with the mild to severe pulmonary artery hypertension in case of a severe mitral stenosis this is a echo image so as we can see in the uh, diastole and aortic valve opening there is only a minimal opening which is actually seen in the parasternal uh, view and this is the valve area which is actually reduced there is actually another method also for finding out the valve area by mitral valve that is by pressure half time pressure half time is nothing but maximum pressure uh, to decrease to half what is the time taken that is the pressure half time we can also grade mitral valve disease by pressure half time it is more than 220 milliseconds then it is severe mitral very severe mitral stenosis and here the valve area by pressure half time is 0.9 cm square which signifies it is a very severe mitral stenosis according to aha 2017 guidelines so in case of ms we always have to look if the patient is in sinus rhythm 
or how is the echo report signifying about the left atrium you always have to look if the patient has got a left atrial clot what is the size of the left atrium you have to find out if the patient has got a spontaneous echo contrast in the left atrium this is the echo image this is the t image which shows the presence of uh, left atrial clot uh, te is better for looking at the uh, left atrial appendage here this is the left atrial appendage and this has got a clot this is a um, echo image showing a spontaneous echo contrast because of blood stasis in the left atrium coming on to medical management of mitral stenosis in case if the patient is an af or the patient has got a prior embolic event or if the patient has got a la thrombus you start them on vitamin k antagonist that is warfarin other anticoagulants has not been well studied in a case of mitral stenosis with af or a valve thromb or an la thrombus in case of mitral stenosis with af with rapid ventricular rate you obviously start them for rate control with the beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker next is the mitral valve regurgitation the causes can again be classified into acute and chronic acute can occur because if the patient has got because of an infective endocarditis or if the patient is undergoing a percutaneous mitral commissurotomy for a mitral stenosis mitral regurgitation can be an acute complication of a valve rupture in case of chronic it can be degenerative rheumatic or functional in case of functional there is no valvular abnormality per se because of the subvalvular apparatus which is getting distorted or uh, deranged by ischemic heart disease dilated cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy without any involvement in the valve the valves are usually normal in case of functional mitral regurgitation so that can also happen that is a functional mitral regurgitation as i have told earlier you have to look for regurgitant volume regurgitant fraction and the effective regurgitant orifice area and vena contracta for a regurgitant lesion it's basically same as that for ar when the vena contracta is more than 7 it is severe and the uh, regurgitant volume if it is less than 30 it is mild if it is more than 60 it is severe if the regurgitant fraction is more than 50 percentage it is severe when the valve effective orifice area if it is more than 0.4 note it is a centimeter square or it becomes 40 mm square then it is a severe valvular mitral regurgitation so this is a echo image showing a color uh, color flow across a mitral valve either in a parasternal long axis view or an apical four chamber view or an apical two chamber view will show that the blood is regurgitating into the left atrium following a mitral regurgitation this is a echo image of a myxomatous valve which can prolapse into and the coaptation point coaptation point is basically where the anterior and the posterior mitral leaflets meet so this may not coapt properly leading to mitral regurgitation coming on to functional mr functional mr as i had said earlier it is because of the derangement which happens at the level of the subvalvular apparatus the normal coaptation point is somewhere here in case of a normal lv but in case of an ischemic mr the lv is remodeled and the coaptation point from here is actually shifted to more apically it is towards more towards the apex so the coaptation is not proper and that leads to the mitral regurgitation jet as you can see the ejection fraction by eyeballing is not obviously 60 and that is regurgitated jet of a functional mr coming on to systolic anterior motion in a hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy this is again a functional mr there is no valvular involvement per se in case of a sam which is a systolic anterior motion in case of a hyperdynamic situation like in hockum what happens is because of the gradient which occurs within the lv the mitral leaflet is kind of pushed or uh, sucked into the left ventricular outflow tract so the coaptation is not proper that leads to a post to ready directed mitral jet so if you give volume these patients may paroxically improve so that is about the functional mr the medical therapy will depend upon how the patient is presenting to you if it's an acute mr then the intervention is different if it's a chronic mr if the patient is symptomatic or if the patient is asymptomatic but has a lv systolic dysfunction so as kadir sir has already mentioned the left ventricular uh, ejection fraction has to be more than at least 70% for them to have a normal ejection fraction of at least 55% because the half of it goes towards the left atrial side 
so if the patient has got an ejection fraction of less than 40 say even with an mr then it means that the patient is having a heart failure with ejection fraction reduced as well so you give them a guideline directed medical therapy which may include ac inhibitors arbs or uh, nepralis interceptor inhibitors if it is an asymptomatic patients you do not treat them uh, for hypertension if they are maintaining close to 140 if it is more than that then you can actually treat them with vasodilators if it's a secondary mr which is a functional mr so you actually put them on because it is because of the ischemic cardiomyopathy which has happened you the treatment varies depending upon the cause if it is a dilated cardiomyopathy it's different if it is hocm it is different and if it's an ischemic heart disease it's different the chronic severe secondary mr if it's because of an ischemic heart disease then you can obviously start them on ac inhibitors arbs sacubitril or valsartan or biventricular pacing the next is the right sided lesions which we are going to see as compared to the left sided lesions these lesions except for tricuspid regurgitation are not significantly uh, seen or not that common uh, in practice so coming on to tricuspid regurgitation as achil sir has mentioned most of the patients they can actually have a physiological tr the other causes can be a carcinoid or a rheumatic or a de uh, degenerative process here also like in mr we have a functional tr which may be because of a pulmonary artery problem or a pulmonary artery hypertension or a left sided uh, failure which has actually precipitated a right sided failure as well so or an rv dysfunction primarily can cause a functional tr without any valvular abnormality so here also if the vena contractor width is more than equal to 7 it is a severe tr when the hepatic inflow a uh, vein inflow then there is a systolic flow reversal as in ar we have seen the holo diastolic flow reversal in ar is a severe ar likewise the flow reversal in a hepatic vein is a severe tr and the regurgitant volume if it is more than 45 ml and the regurgitant area if it is more than 40 then it is a severe tr this is a risk type category when the regurgitant volume uh, is less than 30 ml it's a kind of low risk tr when the regurgitant fraction is more than 50 percentage and regurgitant volume is more than 45 ml then you say it's a high risk tr and here the primarily the tricuspid regurgitation it is because of the valve involvement and the secondary tricuspid regurgitation is because that the rv is dilated or the ventricles are dilated that causes the full and the coaptation point may again move apically and that may cause a secondary tr or a functional tr and this an isolated physiologically some of the patients may have a isolated tr so this is the ma which has got an rv and an ra dilatation and the blood regurgitations into the ra in this image we can see the tricuspid regurgitation actually it is caused by a pacemaker wire so anything which there in a pacemaker wire can actually have a physiological tr as well medical therapy if the patient is actually having a volume overload then you can actually put them on diuretics if the patient has got a secondary tr or a functional tr if the patient uh, tr is secondary to the pulmonary artery hypertension you can start them on vasodilators of pulmonary region if the patient has got secondary tr because of the heart failure then you can start them on guideline directed medical therapy for heart failure tricuspid stenosis pulmonary stenosis and pulmonary regurgitation we don't see that common but for the completion sake we will also look for those particular valvular heart diseases the mean pressure gradient if it is more than 5 mm of mercury and the valve area by continuity equation if it is less than 1 cm square the normal valve area is somewhere around 4 to 6 cm square so if it is less than 1 then it is actually called a severe tr here we can see this is a pressure uh, continuous uh, wave doppler across a uh, tricuspid valve as you can see the mean pressure gradient is more than 15 and the velocity time integral is 118 cm if the velocity integral is more than 60 cm then it is a severe tricuspid stenosis so when you see a echo report saying more than 5 mean gradient and the valve area is less than 1 then it means a severe tricuspid stenosis 
coming on to the pulmonic uh, pulmonic regurgitation as with aortic regurgitation the echo parameters of uh, pr are not that validated you can actually see that uh, none of it like mean or contractor or an effective regurgitant or if i say area or a, uh, res, a regurgitant volume is not defined per se according to the esa guidelines for a pr as done with the ar what you can see is the pulmonic flow versus the aortic flow if it is greatly increased then it is a severe pr if the color wave jet of the pr jet it is a, a steep deceleration then it is a severe pr the cause again can be bicuspid valve unicuspid valve or a quadricuspid valve carcinoid and rheumatic heart disease this actually patients who are undergoing tof repair they can actually present in the adulthood with the pulmonary regurgitation and an infective endocarditis is another such cause coming on to pulmonic stenosis the causes can be bicuspid valve unicuspid valve and so and carcinoid and noonan syndrome it is usually accompanied by rv enlargement when they give the peak velocity is less than 3 then it's a mild ps if it is more than 4 it is severe ps when you say the mean gradient is less than 36 mm of mercury then it is a mild ps when it is more than 64 it's a severe ps it depends upon how the echo report is so the first part of lecture is over how will you assess the severity of valvular heart disease next is to how critical is your patient and how to address them in the perioperative period first of all you see the echo report and assess how severe is your patient according to an echo report before that you assess is the patient symptomatic or asymptomatic the guidelines and the therapy will vary if the patient remains asymptomatic or becomes symptomatic you see to that what is the effort tolerance of the patient and how the response of right ventricle and left ventricle to the valvular heart disease is coming on to the surgical properties is your non cardiac surgery urgent or elective how do you risk classify the surgery into low risk intermediate risk or high risk which one to address first whether you will do a valve surgery or a non cardiac surgery first and risk stratifying indices if it is a severe disease with a symptomatic patient you categorize them into a high risk and per se least risk does not include valvular heart disease but got the goldman cardiac index and death ski does include uh, significant valvular heart disease as their component risk category for cardiac diseases would include low risk it is a superficial surgery breast surgery thyroid or an asymptomatic carotid endarterectomy all these patients will fall under low risk if the patient is going to undergo an intraperitoneal surgery say lap coli or hiatic hernia repair a patient who is symptomatic and undergoing a carotid artery endarterectomy or a carotid artery stenting if it's a peripheral artery angiography a renal transplantation a major neuro ortho and hip and spine intervention they fall in the intermediate category when the risk involves massive fluid shifts and massive blood losses like in ma major vascular surgery involving aorta or open lower limb surgeries liver resection adrenal resection a total removal of a bladder pneumonectomy or a whipple's procedure then that patient basically falls under the high risk unstable cardiac conditions as defined will include recent myocardial infarction less than 30 days when the patient has got significant arrhythmia when the patient has got an acute heart failure when the patient has unstable angina and here comes our topic when the patient has got a severe valvular heart disease when the patient is supposed to be having a unstable cardiac condition coming on to aortic stenosis how do you decide whether the patient undergoes an aortic valve disease first or a non cardiac surgery first how is your patient critical if the patient is symptomatic and has a severe valvular as and the risk of non cardiac surgery is high then the patient is a very critical patient there is obviously an increased perioperative risk for morbidity and mortality in such patients so in severe aortic stenosis you classify them into urgent surgery and elective surgery if it's an urgent surgery you do not look twice you actually start them and proceed with the surgery urgent surgeries do not require any further management or any further evaluation into whether they have to go for a cardiac surgery or the non cardiac surgery you have to go for the advanced hemodynamic monitoring and explain them about the increased perioperative risk and just proceed if the patients are asymptomatic and if the patient is going to undergo high risk non cardiac surgery 
If the risk of transcatheter aortic valve replacement is higher, then you consider going in for a balloon valvuloplasty. If the risk of undergoing a TAVI is lower, then you subject them to TAVI and then do the high-risk non-cardiac surgery. If the patient is still asymptomatic and the risk of surgery is low to moderate, then the surgery can be performed with the increased risk of perioperative events. But if the patient has got severe aortic stenosis, but if the patient is severely symptomatic, you should actually talk to your cardiologist about before going in for a non-cardiac procedure, you should talk to your cardiologist about considering the TAVI. If the risk of TAVI is again high, then you can actually start them with non-cardiac surgery with strict monitoring. I hope I'm clear. Coming on to non-cardiac surgeries for valvular MS. When do you proceed with non-cardiac surgery? If the valve area is more than 1.5 and if the patient is asymptomatic in spite of having a significant stenosis and if the systolic pulmonary artery pressure is less than 50, then you can proceed with non-cardiac surgery in case of a valvular MS. You have to consider percutaneous mitral commissurotomy before non-cardiac surgery when the valve area is less than 1.5 cm square and the patient is severely symptomatic with severe MS and when the uh, systolic pulmonary artery pressure is more than 50 mm of mercury. Any primary regurgitant lesion for a left-sided or right-sided may it be mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation. In the left-sided lesions actually pose an increased risk than mitral regurgitation per se. There is no additional cardiac risk involved if the lesion is not significant, say if it is a mild mitral regurgitation, mild aortic regurgitation or a moderate and the patient is actually asymptomatic, then they do not possess an additional cardiac risk. And even when the patient has got a severe MR and with the preserved ejection fraction and the patient is asymptomatic, then they may not possess an increased cardiac risk. But when the patient actually has increased risk when the patient is symptomatic with a severe AR and a severe MR and with a reduced ejection fraction and also with a systemic, uh, systolic pulmonary artery pressure of more than 50 millimeters of mercury. So how do you address these patients? You decide whether it is an urgent surgery or an elective surgery. If it's an urgent surgery, you proceed with increased risk and perioperative monitoring. If it's an elective surgery, optimize them with medical management and consider valve replacement before non-cardiac surgery if the non-cardiac surgery can wait. Coming on to secondary mitral regurgitation, since because the valve apparatus is not involved per se, but it is a distortion of the subvalvular apparatus, which is the pathology, the management will actually proceed along with the LV systolic function. The management in the perioperative period will change. It is dynamic because it is preload dependent and the rhythm dependence because of secondary mitral regurgitation. So as we have come across, we have actually seen when to proceed with the valvular surgery or a non-cardiac surgery. Here we are to discuss about the cardiac grid for each valvular heart diseases. Cardiac grid is basically, how do you approach these patients <clears throat> with five aspects, say preload, afterload, contractility, PVR, and heart rate. So basically, in any of the heart diseases, you will never decrease contractility. In one place, if you have to decrease contractility, is in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, wherein we'll decrease the contractility. So in all the valvular heart disease, you maintain the contractility. In any regurgitant lesion, you actually maintain a sinus rhythm of a slightly higher rate, say 90 to 100, because essentially the diastolic time is actually decreased so that the regurgitant fraction also becomes decreased. So in regurgitant lesions, maintain a slightly higher heart rate. In stenotic lesions, you need some time for the valve to push the blood against the stenotic valve. So you actually basically decrease the heart rate or maintain to low normal heart rate. As mentioned earlier, these valvular heart disease, which are stenotic, they depend upon the atrial kick, which may actually contribute to, rather than in normal patients, it may contribute to 15% of the cardiac output. But in stenotic valvular heart disease patients, it may contribute higher up to 30% of the cardiac output. So that atrial kick becomes necessary. So you always maintain the stenotic lesion in a low normal heart rate or a sin and sinus rhythm. So essentially, the cardiac grid for valvular heart disease becomes the preload you will increase and maintain. You will not increase it more so that it uh, back, backfires, but you have to increase and maintain. Any decrease in preload will actually cause a simultaneous decrease in the stroke volume and the cardiac output also. In case of 
systemic vascular resistance in AS, you actually have to increase it and maintain it because that is the one which actually supplies the coronaries, which actually helps in supplying the peripheries. Had you say you give you have given a 3 ml of spinal um, local anesthetic and the SVR falls, you are actually having one foot in the grave in such patients. You have to maintain the PVR and the heart rate to low normal or sinus rhythm. And you maintain the contractility. On a whole, in AS, you maintain the preload, you maintain the SVR as well, and the heart rate goes to low normal or sinus rhythm. Coming on to MS, it is same. Uh, in MS, it can be quite tricky. You have to maintain the preload such that it has uh, adequate preload to pump against the stenotic mitral valve. And you do not overload such that it back pressures into the uh, lungs as well. So it's a tricky position in a mitral uh, stenosis. Here again, you maintain it as a normal, low normal or the sinus rhythm. You maintain the uh, contractility. You maintain the SVR here as well. You do not decrease an SVR drastically in a mitral stenosis also. In case of pulmonary vascular resistance, you decrease it because the right ventricle is the one which is going to bear the brunt of the mitral stenosis and not the left ventricle per se. Coming on to regurgitant lesions, it will depend upon whether it is acute or chronic, whether it is functional or primary. In case of an AR, you actually increase the preload. As I said, in any regurgitant lesion, you increase the heart rate, you maintain the contractility. In any regurgitant lesion, you actually decrease the SVR. So here we can actually go along with our uh, combined spinal epidural technique or uh, if the patient is not in failure, then we can actually go for a um, uh, regional anesthesia technique for such patients. You maintain PVR. Say if the patient has got an organic MR or if the patient has got a structural MR, then you actually increase the preload in such patients. You increase the heart rate. You maintain the contractility. You decrease the SVR and maintain the PVR. But if the MR is actually secondary to ischemic heart disease, then you actually kind of reserve the uh, preload. You don't overload the patient because the patient has MR. It is because if the ischemic lesion, the patient has MR. So in those patients, you do not overload. You actually guard the preload in such patients. Also for the heart rate, if the patient has got an ischemic heart disease, then you don't uh, actually want the patient to be on the high heart rate higher side just because the patient has MR. So coming on to dealing with perioperative emergencies, in the perioperative period, what we are worried is the hemodynamic instability and the rhythm abnormality. All these can occur only with the precipitating factor, may it be bleeding, because that will decrease the preload. If you have not actually calculated it well and supplemented the IV fluids or blood per se, Inadequate analgesia, which in a stenotic lesion can lead to sinus tachycardia and lead to a vicious cycle of failure in case of stenosis, stenotic lesions. May it be fluid shifts, as I have mentioned, in a diastolic dysfunction, you put them on a lithotomy, then uh, that is it. So they go for a pulmonary edema. That's the case also. Uh, in case of a mitral stenosis, like if the patient has got a severe stenosis and the patient is undergoing a lower segment cesarean section and the obstetrician clamps the uh, umbilical cord, suddenly the autotransfusion occurs and the patient may at that time decompensate. At any point of time in these perioperative emergencies, you address the precipitating cause. You do an airway instrumentation and uh, when the patient is not adequately under, then again the tachycardia will worsen in case of a stenotic lesion. Any precipitating cause, you treat that precipitating cause first. Then, then you always restore the cardiac grid to normal. Then your patients may have a better outcome. So the perioperative emergencies, we have to keep this addressing the precipitating factors as the first point because before that the patient was fine. Only after the precipitating factor that the patient go in for a vicious cycle of failure. So the take-home message is, know what is the valvular heart disease the patient has got, know the severity and decide whether to proceed with non-cardiac surgery first or the valvular heart disease first. You always discuss with your cardiologist about the echo report, whether it is like uh, safe to go along with, if it's a case of an aortic stenosis, which is um, for me, aortic stenosis with reduced ejection fraction is the patient I would consider the most critical patient. So I would actually discuss with the cardiologist whether to go for a TAVI before a non-cardiac surgery or go for a non-cardiac surgery, an elective non-cardiac surgery. In case of emergency, there is no role for TAVI or any procedures, valvular procedures per se. 
coming on to whether you go for general anesthesia regional anesthesia or general anesthesia with re regional anesthesia in case of regurgitant lesions we can actually go for regional anesthesia where you want to decrease the svr but in case of stenotic lesions it depends upon how the patient presents to you if the mitral stenosis patient presents to you in failure then obviously we may not go for a regional anesthesia but in case of an aortic stenosis say moderate you can actually go for a regional anesthesia titrated with the noradrenaline doses or give um, continuous spinal anesthesia of low doses so that you did not decrease the svr so much and land up in trouble so you always have to be aware of the pathophysiology and the cardiac grit you treat about the patients for in case of any perioperative instability you always address the precipitating cause which may be patient to ponder in the vicious cycle and these are my references thank you thank you guru santhia uh, for this uh, wonderful talk and um, she has pretty much discussed about the eco as well as the management of the valvular heart diseases and uh, the uh, forum is now open for discussion uh, pravin nimma sir uh, your comments please it's a very good presentation thank you sir uh, i would just add one or two points here uh, see the when you are talking about the functional mr yes sir it is important to address the issue yes, means generally speaking functional mr means it is because of the ischemia myocardial ischemia so what is important when you manage such cases it is the myocardial ischemia that has to be addressed so that the worsening of MR. and in addition to that you is the you provide condition that the heart empties better in circulation that means but there if suppose the patient is having ischemic heart you have to have a balance in dilatation as well as vasoconstriction else what will happen to may improve the output, output but the myocardial perfusion mess up so it's a difficult trade off but you have to constant uh, keep a, keep an eye on the ecg or if you have got a t you have to keep on looking at the myocardial you see the functions and the regional valve motion abnormal see there are so many uh, reports uh, that uh, if uh, especially functional mr the surgeon should not touch that mitral valve because the mortality okay. is very very high with cabg mbr so it is better to leave them leave it alone and over a period of time uh, it uh, it remodels itself and the functional mr will come down so it is not necessary that you always tackle the functional mr when you are doing a cabg the other point is uh, madam tavi is not that common see we are talking yeah. about the uh, because the first first of all it's very very expensive the secondly yes. there are not much uh, experienced people or experienced centers doing it so it is uh, it is a it is quite a, a rare uh, thing to do tavi unless the patient is uh, well off instead of that uh, if a patient needs you can advise avia tavi is used only for selected patients like a patient who is 80 years old with a severe aortic stenosis multiple comorbidities then only tavi is indicated and that patient is going for non uh, cardiac surgery is very very rare the second thing is that you, you should have touched about the regional blocks which are very very important in such patients so that least hemodynamic uh, derangement uh, will take place and who else than um, uh, dr shiv is the pioneer in that and i feel that uh, Uh, for all even for cardiac anesthetist uh, yeah. a, a cardiac anesthetist one should learn blocks now there is a high time and it's a, it, it's it's a, it's a it's a call of the day uh, that yeah. we must learn uh, all of us should learn the uh, uh, the nerve blocks which hard, which hardly do anything to hemodynamics so yeah. i think it is a, it, is, it is wonderful techniques and with the uh, lesions what you have mentioned none of the regional blocks will interfere in that yes the hemodynamics will be rock steady with uh, probably mma you add into that multimodal analgesia mm -hmm. because uh, 
uh, in our group we have seen that so many uh, yes, people are doing that especially mm. uh, dr shiv rajesh shaha i can name them uh, they, they are doing wonderful job and uh, with the ef was 20% and all patients are doing very well so you should have touched on that because this this is for general <laughs> public no so, this is Yes, yeah, so no, I think uh, yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, because we're already running quite late. Uh, I think that's not. Uh, I think probably on its own, it's a uh, yeah. full symposium if we have to talk about. Uh, we actually do uh, see uh, situations where patients actually have to undergo non-cardiac surgery and have got like uh, severe aortic stenosis or other. Well, well, aortic stenosis probably is the commonest one we actually come across. And one of the commonest uh, kind of, uh, you know, combined lesion is actually stenosis of the carotids and aortic stenosis. You see it's very commonly. So when these patients are actually referred to the cardiac centers, you know what they do? They say, first get the carotid done, then you come to us. The reason being is very simple. They know that if the patient actually has a heart surgery or whatever kind, and if patients develop any stroke, uh, it comes until uh, their, uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, you know, a rating kind of thing they have. Uh, isn't it for cardiac, cardiac surgery? Everybody is rated uh, universally. Uh, league, league tables, that goes into the league tables. So they don't want to actually touch these patients. So we end up actually managing these cases. Uh, you know, before they actually get for. I mean, we do, our centers do actually Tabi very commonly. It's not an uncommon uh, thing for patients. So if they were going to actually have something like a hip surgery, they don't mind. Uh, they will do a Tabi and then patient will come to us. But if something, you know, which can affect their outcome, then they won't, especially carotid, they won't touch the carotid uh, stenosis patients. Most of the time, this, uh, both surgeries are done at the same sitting. Carotid no, endarticotomy no. uh, with AV, AVR because we have been doing like that. So yeah. first you attack on the carotids and then uh, you go ahead with the... And here, um, uh, some of the cardiac surgeons, they themselves do it. Uh, uh, that, that, that's, the problem. that's the problem in UK because vascular surgeons are not cardiac surgeons here. Yeah. So vascular surgery is a separate specialty by itself. So our cardiac centers, they don't do carotids. It's done at our, our center, which is a vascular center. There are so many reports about the combined surgeries do yeah. better than the, uh, than the planned, uh, I mean, one after the other, so. Yeah, I mean, that would be the ideal thing, isn't yeah, it? It's ideal. It's the same. Why, why patient be exposed to two anesthesias? True, true. The thing can be done. Dr. Achal, I wanted to actually say something. Yeah, I totally agree that it is a very center-specific approach. Mm -hmm. There is always a debate between heart versus brain, which mm -hmm. organ to tackle first. <laughs> uh, yes, our center does lots of TAVIs. So just to support uh, Guru Santhya's point, she had to cover and give different options to all the patients, whether it's a resource poor or resource. So at least it, is, it may be a theoretical for some, but it is very practical. We have had patients with end-stage liver disease with severe aortic stenosis, not fit for liver transplant, underwent TAVI, then underwent successful liver transplant. Mm. And the point I just want to make is uh, we also do, our centers also do the angioplasty of the carotids, which again is a non-invasive procedure. Yeah. So if it's a very significant stenosis, you can do the angioplasty, then fix the heart. So it's always a debatable thing whether to tackle the carotid stenosis, if it is significant, patient is getting frequent TIAs, then I think mm -hmm. it makes sense that, uh, of course, stroke has more devastating uh, problems than uh, other stuff. So, and we know patient is a very high risk anyway, whichever uh, surgery comes first. So since because my references were EC guidelines and AHA guidelines, though there I think it's more common to do a TAVI, not quite common in India because the guidelines says so I have to stick to guidelines. <laughs> so true, but uh, you have to select the patients for TAVI. Yes. I mean, yes, now earlier it was only for the older age group, but now it is uh, becoming more common for the younger age group also because there are certain criteria for which TAVI is done. It's yeah. not oh. everybody fits into that. Yes. So and also I in, I'm talking about like 
achal and other Agar people are uh, in the western countries uh, they have no resource uh, uh, constraint but in india yes, and also the experience in india there are there are i think five or six centers where they are doing that very regularly and in, money, money involved is very expensive my my sister underwent she has to cover 35 lakhs indian oh rupees God. for, uh, for uh, yes sir for tv because anyway she there was an indication she is 78 years old and mm. with um, uh, i mean she didn't want any <laughs> she didn't want to go under undergo surgery so that was the only option but dr neema well. wanted to say something dr neema i just i just want to add some points over here yes I, sir it is very expensive in india but now i think majority of the centers you can get it done for 25 lakhs hmm it's still it's quite a significant down. amount of money it's a quite a significant amount but it has come down it is not hmm. more 35 or 40 lakhs it has come down okay. that is one thing hmm. uh, secondly see the is earlier the indications oh. for heavy was poor risk cases elderly cases hmm. but over a period of time with the, as the experience of cardiologists have increased they are now advocating tavi for <laughs> risk cases also so may be quite possible over a period of time mm. that it is possible that good risk cases where we do avr you may find they will be undergoing tavi as the number increases yeah that's true and quite possible that over next set of 15 20 years you may you may not find too many too many open avrs you may mm. find tavis yeah yes same thing as what has happened with the endovascular repairs for aortic aneurysms Yeah, like, costly, and then it's it's now uh, the number of open aneurysms we do has come down drastically. True, I, I think uh, one of the important thing uh, to remember is in pre-operative workup. Um, as an anesthesiologist, there are cases you will be presented with diagnosis of valvular heart disease, but in other cases you may be the first one to pick up. Mm-hmm. um so you go and see a patient you auscultate you find a murmur and then ask for echocardiogram and you find a severe aortic stenosis mm-hmm. and there are several cases i can tell you example in our center we do echo ourselves in pre op clinic wow and one of the patient was typical um the patient fell down uh, while doing lawn um and then came with a and they want to repair the facial fracture mm-hmm. and then our one of our resident auscultated and found a systolic murmur mm-hmm. and then we went and saw the patient has actually a critical aortic stenosis we don't know how he was living with it but the reason for fall was syncope um mm-hmm. it's it's not the fall produced facial fracture uh, the syncope aortic stenosis produced fall and then the fall led to facial fractures so now mm. you have a dilemma whether to repair the aortic valve or not so one important decision making in tavi versus uh, surgical avr do you have any associated cardiac problems you always do a cath to find out whether the patient has ischemic heart disease if he has cad then you it's to do a cabbage and avr surgically rather than just doing a tavi and mm. number 2 is this patient ended up in also having a dilated iota in addition to aortic stenosis so mm. his ascending iota was 5 cm so he ended up in having cabbage avr and um the the ascending aortic replacement mm. um but do you do that before facial fracture probably not so mm. i so we ended up in doing an aortic valvuloplasty as a temporary measure mm. um did the um non cardiac surgery and the patient went for a elective cardiac surgical procedure so each case needs a pupil on table to discuss that's what should happen a cardiologist a cardiac surgeon anesthesiologist a surgeon who is non cardiac surgeon who is doing the procedure put everybody on table and discuss the options 1 2 3 and mm. then decide what is best for the patient i that's what should happen in that situations mm. just I mean, one like, point if if the patient has a cad and a um, uh, aortic stenosis they will always go uh, first for the cab because the tavi cannot tavi is very risky once the patient Undergoes coronary artery bypass grafting because 
the corner is may get uh, pinched or the uh, the conduits may get pinched when you are you are implanting the valve so it is always uh, first cabg followed by tavi if it was necessary if the patient is um, willing for that yeah again there are options on table you can do a stent for the vessels uh, and then do tavi it's it's not that you have you have to put multiple options if the patient is a non operative candidate um you can do stents on important vessels you can do a tavi and then do a non cardiac surgery uh, but if the patient is a good surgical candidate i will do a surgical cabbage and surgical avr um so it really really depends on each case should be individualized in their management dr rachel was wanting to say something yeah i just wanted to highlight the same point if patient is okay for open heart surgery then we can tackle both the problems in one go like cabbage and aortic valve but if mm. patient is not a good surgical material anyway because of poor protoplasm then we have options of doing non surgical way of dealing with coronary artery disease and with the aortic stenosis i agree so yeah so one <clears throat> one of the other other areas we actually see a lot of um, the valvular heart disease and then again the aorta actually comes in here is uh, the elderly patient with fractures we again don't know what has caused the fracture <laughs> if they fell and you know happened or they had as because there was low cardiac output or coronaries weren't we don't actually come to know a lot of times but uh, many times this patient actually come to the theater without anything except for obviously the bloods will be done ecg will be done sometimes somebody auscultates and outer sclerosis is very very common in the elderly so is it right to say because the while i was actually reading about that they said the outer sclerosis is actually worse than a uh, you know aortic stenosis as such is that true i i probably won't say that aortic mm -hmm. the sclerosis is very common in old age and it yeah. doesn't mean the valve is stenotic um, yeah. to, to get a valve stenotic it has to fulfill the futures um you know guru cynthia described um so i won't put a lot of importance on aortic sclerosis which can be a degenerative change seen in most individuals yeah rather actually i thought aortic sclerosis is actually pretty productive because the valves are actually they're shrunken but also they contract and there is always a component of regurgitation present in aortic stenosis in aortic sclerosis patient uh, so i think that's what actually saves them and they are for a long time so again these cases the uh, orthopedic uh, you know they're not going to get uh, go to uh, for a Uh, surgery on aorta whether it is tavi or open they're not going to go to the cardiac center they're not like, going to accept a patient with a fracture till it is actually fixed and also the mo morbidity mortality increases as we delay the surgery on the hips so i think they say okay if this patient can survive this fracture then okay then come to us <laughs> otherwise <laughs> jao <laughs> yeah. yeah i th i think that that is maybe scenario may be dif different for a degenerative hip mm. um if somebody is going elective total hip replacement then the scenario may be different i may ask them to do a tavi yeah. and then come i they, the cardiologist always argue with me why don't you do this procedure and get over i can mm. give safe anesthesia intra op but the patient has to undergo you know after hip a lot of physical therapy and a lot of things happens post operatively where the patient may not do well uh, so that's where the opening the valve will help for the patient yeah that that's right so elective patients we don't we can actually say no it's only that when they come with a fractures so hip fractures then we have no other option but to actually manage so in the that that way i think uh, there was a time recently i think uh, dr hemant only uh, had posted the uh, difference between the regional anesthesia and uh, uh, you know ga for these patients which there's no difference so our centers was one of them when i actually joined as a consultant where i actually started doing ga with blocks and we were actually doing most of these cases with ga and one of the reasons was because i had actually seen 
is a consultant actually give a spinal to a patient and patient actually arrested on table. And there have been some more cases like that. And then people actually say, if you do not know what's happening with the heart, you do not have an echocardiogram. Okay. You actually haven't auscultated it properly. You don't know what it is. Then better treat them that as if they have got a stenotic lesion and go ahead with just GA plus blocks and it works. And we, I think, uh, yeah, Dr. Achal, yeah. Yeah, another uh, experience I had, and again, a very kind of uh, uh, debatable issue is patient having cancer of colon coming for cancer surgery, and then also has the aortic stenosis. That's about so about 10 days, two weeks ago, I was doing, I was doing just the echoes for cardiac. So I was mm. requested to do an echo for this non-cardiac patient who mm. had an aortic valve area of 0.9, with mm. severe aortic stenosis, had mm. uh, uh, colon cancer, and coming for cancer uh, uh, surgery, resection of the colon. Yes. So my first question was, why didn't you ask for TAVI first? And so that was discussed in the cardiology rounds. And again, uh, the cardiologist said that patient was asymptomatic. For mm. them, if patient is not complaining of any presyncope or any angina, if patient is bedridden, so they mm. say patient is asymptomatic, so does not need a valve replacement, <laughs> which again, we have to take with a pinch of salt. Pinch of salt surely. Yeah. And uh, if patient is, of course, exerting themselves, then they will be symptomatic. So mm. anyway, so this was not my decision. I was just called to do the echo. And again, patient had severe aortic stenosis. We took all the precautions. Unfortunately, mm. the cancer turned out to be undesectable. So they had to just open and shut the case. But yes, mm. these... Odd cases just fall through the cracks. Yeah. Undiagnosed aortic stenosis, typically after fracture rape or any emergency surgery. And then it is a big uh, diagnostic dilemma. Mm. Lovely. Uh, thank you, guys. I think it's, it's now nearly four hours of uh, continuous thing. Uh, before we actually end the session, uh, two things uh, I would actually ask you guys. is One thing is that if somebody wants to uh, start learning echocardiogra uh, echocardiography like uh, for journalist how would they go about one second thing do you think like uh, that actually comes from uh, dr ajal and from kathir wells uh, comments uh, shouldn't uh, the pre op clinics be also doing the uh, pre the anesthetists who do pre op clinics be also doing the echocardiogram say they at least have that skill shouldn't it be a prerequisite that uh, if you are going to take up pre operative sessions then you should also know how to do echocardiogram, at least th time throws echocardiogram. Um, what do you think about the training, training part? Uh, sir, uh, uh, training part, uh, physical uh, like uh, presence for training uh, is very important in case of eco, if you want to learn echocardiography as such. And uh, this we can do in two ways. We usually conduct workshops every year Due to yes. co uh, COVID, we didn't do that, but uh, we'll start uh, probably from next year again. Uh, we did it, uh, I think, in Faridabad, uh, focus, which was yeah, hands on training. So yeah. uh, we can again keep this uh, six uh, monthly or so like that, and we can take a full day session. And yeah. that is one thing which we can do mm, together. And I also conduct individually. I conduct only seven to eight people I take and uh, individually I oh, give them hands-on training for one day, which is called as eco-wise training. Yeah. So uh, that is uh, what I do. And um, I, 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 I think that uh, it, is, it is very important that uh, not only eco-interpretation, but everyone has to get acquainted uh, by uh, doing it actually on the patient so that uh, your anesthesia management changes a lot and uh, you can do modifications uh, for the patient's benefit. That's true. Dr. Uh, Nima wanted to actually say something. Dr. Nima, sir. So the, when uh, I was there at AMS Raipur, hmm. I started posting my postgraduates in cardiology department. Yeah. Hello? To learn transthoracic echocardiogram. Hmm. So that you see the, they can, you see the, we were having a machine there in the uh, yeah. pop and uh, critical care. You can use it and they can find out what actually is happening to the patients. Hmm. So it is, you see, it's not that, uh, you see, the training after it has to start 
when they are getting training in the anesthesia. That's that's right. I think it's starting early. I think at uh, year one itself and exposing to them. I think there is always a fear. Um, you know, okay, fine. I can put a probe. I can see something. Then what is about interpretation? Uh, obviously, if the consultants are not trained, they can't then train the juniors. Uh, Dr. Achal. Yeah, just one comment on this. Our residents, of course, go through the proper focus, focus training. And uh, the problem, I think, is you can attend the workshop. You know all the knowledge, everything. You go back home, then you don't practice that for six months That's or right. one year. You're back to square one. I That's can give you my example. I'm TE certified, board certified uh, for last uh, many years. Anyway, I attended many transthoracic workshops, just wanted to update my knowledge. I have all the background knowledge. I attended many workshops, but back home, my practice is very busy. I don't have time. And in six months time, again, when the time comes, I am back to zero. So hmm. if this is happening to me, I can sure it will happen to most yeah, of us. Continue. So practice after the workshop or after getting the proper training is very important. Number two, I should point out here, like the ASA has their proper certification course for non-cardiac anesthesiologists, the basic hmm. training. Yeah. So it's very important to have the proper training, full course certification. And after that, managing the patients, because little knowledge is always a dangerous thing. Danger. Yeah. You can always mismanage a patient yeah. looking at a probe in a wrong direction and diagnosing something which is not there, and then yeah. kind of causing harm to the patient rather than benefit. So this is a very kind of uh, uh, difficult situation, I would say. Yeah, so um, I think this is also uh, provides an opportunity for mm. um, for the group or for the uh, amarja or whoever want to lead. Um, so in 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 our center, we have a very very good transthoracic echo program. Any patient perioperatively needs echo, we do it. Whether whether it's pre-op pre-op clinic or pre-op holding area, intra-op or post-op, anywhere. The echo means they, the surgeons call us rather than, they rather have us do it. It's quick because it, the echo lab technician has to come and then they record the images for 45 minutes. We take hardly 15 <laughs> minutes. And then they, they have to go and put it in their file and the cardiologist has to see that and read it and report it. The turnover time is very high for a cardiology performed echo compared to you know, bedside anesthesiologist who does the echo. So you want to really, really develop a solid program. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you know, I can really, if, if uh, s someone from India can take initiative, we can mm -hmm. really help with that kind of thing. You do need a, uh, the, it needs the steps of training, just like Archel mentioned, like uh, ASA certification. You need a web-based platform. Uh, people just go through it at the beginning. Number two, you need a simulator training. Uh, number three is you need training like Amarja conducts every six months, hands-on training. And yeah. then you need those things exposed to a normal views, normal performance of echo, yeah. but you are not echo exposed to pathology. So for that, you need to go through uh, 200 videos of pathological clips. Mm. Um, you know, that is in ASA library has it. We can create a library like that. We all have rich sources of echo. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, we can create that. And then um, number four, the fifth phase is the most important phase, which I shall mention. The person who trained in all these four has to go back and consistently practice it. Um, you know, every week they have to do four or five transthoracic echoes. Um, then, uh, then they are first trained and then they train the other people. Mm -hmm. You know, so each center we should select a person who can do this and then go with it. So you do really need a structured program, um, initiative, leadership, efforts, all these things to make this happen. Any here and there training will not work, you know. That's true. That's true. Okay, guys, I think it's pretty late in India. Um, 
I think uh, some of them must be already hungry. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, to uh, Kathir, Achal, uh, Manithi, Dr. Heyman, uh, Dr. Nema, Guru Cynthia, and of course, Amarja, uh, who has conducted that. And a very good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chief, sir, yeah. and all the faculty. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank See you, you again sometime.